So good afternoon. So as, as I was saying, this uh, tutorial is about uh, modeling symbolic knowledge using uh, neural representation. So we want to look a little bit about the relationship between uh, symbolic knowledge and neural representations. Uh, in particular, we want to focus on the use of vector space representations to capture or to model knowledge. So uh, I'm Victor Gutierrez Basulto, and uh, this tutorial uh, will be also will be also given by Stephen Schockert. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, this this is kind of the the main objective of the of the tutorial. But then the main question is why we why we would like to do this? Why do we want to understand this relationship between symbolic knowledge and neural representation? So isn't it enough just to stick to one of the approaches to AI, say uh, the KR or symbolic one or to the neural one? So I want to motivate first and say why this is not the case. So let's look at uh, some examples. So the first thing that I want to talk a little bit about is why do we need neural networks? So um, usually symbolic knowledge is uh, manually encoded or curated. And this is the main uh, bottleneck for constructing really big uh, ontologies or really big knowledge bases because at the end it's very demanding. You don't have enough experts. Experts are not good programmers, so they might have a good idea of what is the kind of knowledge that you want to express, but they don't know exactly how to express it in a given formalism. And you could also kind, or uh, you could also try to rely in crowdsourcing, but uh, this might be expensive, right? If you are trying to construct a very large knowledge base. So I guess then we have to live with the fact that knowledge bases are inevitably incomplete. On the other hand, we have that uh, neural networks are trained end to end. So there is no real need to, to for humans to participate much. So you give it the data and they do it everything starting from the data and they have also a strong generalization capabilities. So uh, this is one of the reasons why we believe we need neural networks. Another reason why we need neural networks is because uh, with symbolic, only with symbolic knowledge, knowledge it's very difficult to do uh, approximate reasoning or having kind of reasoning algorithms in the case where uh, knowledge bases are incomplete. Let's look at the following example. Uh, imagine I have the following query who is asking who co-authored with Canadian Turin Award uh, winners. So we have the, the, the following uh, knowledge graph, which uh, in which I have the Turing Award winners. And I have also the um, those citizens that are Canadian. And then uh, if I start from Turing Award, uh, I see that people that have win this award are uh, Lecun, Hinton, Benjo, uh, and that's it. And Canadian citizens, I have Hinton, Benjo, Cheriton, and Trudeau. Then I can move, uh, I can traverse the knowledge graph and move with the co author um, relationship. And I can see which, uh, which are the persons with, with which these uh, authors or these winning, during our winners have co authored papers. So indeed, I can positively or completely answer for the case of Jan LeCun for the case of Hinton. Now for the case of Jan LeCun, no, because he has not be, he is not a Canadian citizen, he is French. For Hinton I could do because he is both a Turing Award winner and a Canadian. But then suddenly I cannot have the uh, answers for Benjo. And uh, this is the case because uh, there are missing links in the knowledge graph. So in this case, I'm missing these answers. And uh, symbolic methods are not good at uh, dealing with this. So they don't know exactly how to cope with the fact that, uh, that there are missing, missing links in the, in the knowledge graph. So this is one of the reasons why I would like to, to use neural networks. Furthermore, uh, we already said that uh, knowledge graphs or knowledge bases are inevitably uh, incomplete. 
but uh, this is even worse in the case when we are trying to, to, to construct common sense knowledge bases. And this common sense knowledge is uh, required, for example, in NLP tasks, such as machine reading comprehension. Um, and they are kind of more incomplete because they are trying to capture general knowledge. So let's look at the following example. We have that um, the following uh, knowledge graph, which caps captures uh, events, effects, uh, reactions, causes. Uh, we have the originally we have properly captured that person X goes to the store. Then, if it if this person X goes to the store, the intent of X is to get food. So this is kind of uh, common sense knowledge. But of course, there are many, many other possibilities uh, why they need to go to the store, what causes this and that. And for example, in, the, in this current uh, knowledge graph, it's not stated that X needs to bring a wallet to the store. So in, in that sense, we really require some mechanisms to complete uh, incomplete knowledge, knowledge graphs, right? Or to deal with the fact that they are incomplete. Furthermore, uh, common sense knowledge bases are noisy. Uh, they are much more uh, noisy than um, uh, domain specific knowledge bases. For example, in ConceptNet, we have the concept uh, popcorn is required for watching a movie, which uh, it is not the case. So this is false. So you don't, you don't require uh, popcorn to watch a movie. And, as this kind of example, there are many kind of these type of examples in these uh, knowledge bases, and this is the case simply because it's very hard to 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 know exactly which kind of knowledge you want to put into these knowledge graphs because they are really context dependent. They are vague uh, uh, just by nature. Um, furthermore, uh, it's just like intrinsically hard to, to, to capture or to model common sense knowledge using symbols. Uh, as I was saying, this is the case because, uh, because um, common sense knowledge is vague, subjective uh, and informal. And then, so we want to, 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 to talk about the fact that things are kind of similar or that in a given context, they are typically the same. And, this is hard to do with symbols. So for example, we would like to have uh, that if we know that apple is a fruit and that uh, if we know that apple and orange are kind of similar in, in some sense, then we would like to conclude that orange is uh, a fruit as well. So, but the main problem there is that uh, normally to, to, to have this kind of typicality of similarity encoded uh, symbolically, we use uh, some sort of graded uh, operator talking about the, the typicality. And the question is, uh, the first problem is from where do we get this kind of weights or, or uh, that, that we have? And how similar or how high needs to be this weight for being able to conclude, for example, that orange is a fruit. So this is unclear and this might really depend on the context. So. Uh, this is something that is very difficult to capture uh, if we use only symbols. We are not able to talk about the different properties of apple and orange in a given context or in a given situation. So uh, yeah, so let's now look at another reason why do we need uh, neural networks. Uh, one other reason is that existing large scale knowledge bases, let's say uh, free base, DBP, the atomic or concept net, are mostly limited to factual knowledge. So uh, they are huge. They have billions of triples. They are huge graphs if you want to see them as graphs. But uh, the, the amount of terminological or ontological knowledge that they, that they have, though, that is explicitly written, it's, it's really few. So that there are not really ontologies available to work with uh, these large knowledge bases. Uh, one could claim that, for example, or one could think that one could use uh, learning uh, rules that to uh, methods to learn rules um, that work symbolically. 
But the problem with these uh, methods is that they typically only cover situations that are witnessed in, in the training data, right? So to construct new rules, they really need to see a lot of examples or the part of the database uh, or the part of the data of the knowledge base needs to be big in order to construct a new uh, rules. And anyway, they will be only constrained to the things that are witnessed to the situations that are witnessed within the data. On the other hand, uh, neural network models have the ability to interpolate between such situations. So they have this capability of induce uh, new rules based on the situation that is uh, the neural network is seen in the training data. So we have already seen some, so, some reasons, incompleteness, uh, hard to, to, to deal with common sense knowledge, uh, the fact that we don't have too much ontologies, but also there is the, the fact of the brittleness of logic. So uh, logic, logic systems are not very good at handling or dealing with a new situations that are not occurring in the knowledge base. So uh, the main reason is that symbols, they don't share information. So symbols themselves. Uh, of course, you could explicitly state that two, two predicates, for example, are related using rules, but, uh, but you need to explicitly write it, right? So the symbols, just by looking at the symbols, they, they don't say anything about whether they are similar or they are uh, close in some uh, particular way. Let's look at the following example. Uh, imagine we have this uh, small logic program, which uh, describes uh, when someone is the grandfather of someone else. So we, we have that X is the grandfather of Y, if X is the father of Z and Z is the parent of Y. So it's not hard to see that uh, we could conclude using the two facts above and the rule that uh, Abe is the, the grandfather of Bart. However, if we try to prove the same thing for uh, gram grandpa of Abe Bart, the, simply our system will fail. Why? Because we don't have explicitly written a rule that talks about the fact that a grandfather and grandpa of uh, are in some way related or that they are similar and probably they should have the same kind of uh, conclusions. So in that sense, uh, logic is kind of too, too rigid, don't, doesn't allow for the, that kind of flexibility. Another reason why do we need uh, neural networks? So uh, probably this is the, 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 the easiest one to see. It's not only, uh, well, it's also related with the fact of representing knowledge, but it's also uh, the fact of dealing with a particular type of, of, of data or perception, right? So pure symbolic systems cannot deal with uh, low level perception. Think about uh, images or audio or yeah, low level perception. So, we need to find a way then to incorporate uh, uh, neural neural networks within our systems in such a way that we can use the the, the input of this uh, vision or images. This one is a little bit in the in I would say in the in in the border and and, and I want to I want to use this one that is in the border before I move to why we need uh, symbolic knowledge. Uh, because here, indeed, we need neural networks to, to, to capture or to deal with low-level perception. But on the other hand, we need symbols to do intricate reasoning, right? So we might decide, I don't know, who is standing next to someone else, or what are the objects uh, that are of color red, which are neighboring to those objects that are of color uh, yellow. And uh, neural networks have a very difficult time doing such intricate reasoning. So we, in that sense, uh, neural networks or AI systems need uh, symbolic knowledge. As I said, uh, I, I want to, to now move to the, to the next uh, part in which I, I want to, to discuss a little bit of why do we need symbolic representations. So there is this um, kind of very famous cartoon in which uh, person A asks uh, person B, this is your machine learning system. Uh, person B answers, yep. You put the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just steer the pile until they start looking right. 
So there is no big, it's not a big secret that they, one of the main problems of uh, neural networks is that they are black boxes. So you really don't know what is happening inside. Uh, furthermore, they required a lot of data to, to work correctly, right? So they are not by nature able to, to deal with implicit knowledge, which is something that uh, symbolic systems are very capable of doing. So then wh wh what is the aim? What, why would we, why would we like to have uh, symbolic knowledge within these neural network, network systems? Well, we would like to have it because we would like to provide uh, the system, not just with data, with tons of data, uh, labeled data saying these are the positive examples and these are the negative examples, but having a, a more kind of um, high level description of different situations, so kind of uh, implicit knowledge, uh, so which we will call explanations. And this could be, this could take the form of rules or programs. And on the other hand, on the other side, uh, once we get the answers, we would also would like to have some sort of explanations. So, uh, and these explanations, once again, they could take the form of rules or programs. So, um, why why is is it desirable to have these explanations both uh, in the input and in the output? So, well, on the one hand, uh, this could lead to having more data efficient systems, simply because uh, you would have a more high level description of the things that you want uh, your, your system to, to learn or the kind of data that they, how the data should behave within the, your system. And in the output, you could have some more interpretability, right? So if you output uh, rules, at least the user knows what are the kind of things that you are, that you are learning. So let's, let's look at uh, some examples uh, along these lines. So people have worked on regularizing neural networks so to promote first order logic constraints among outputs. So in that sense, we really put, we really want to put the knowledge of, uh, of rules such as like these ones that I have here, like these ones that I have here uh, during the training, right? So such, in such a way that the output really tries to follow uh, or the, 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 the knowledge that is imposed by the constraints if you see uh, these rules as constraints. One of the reasons why we, want, we, we would like to use um, logic is because uh, as I was saying, we want, this could lead to the it for a lot of data. So in a sense, we could use logic to, to, guide, to guide the machine learning procedure, right? So we don't have that much data, but we have some this kind of implicit knowledge that will be guiding the, the, the whole process. Uh, now, how about the outputs? So as I was saying, we would like to have something uh, interpretable. One, one possible way of doing this is to uh, work with differentiable theorem provers, which what they do is that they neuralize problems backward chaining. So in a sense, you have you don't have now this very strict and rigid unification, but you have kind of a flexible one, a differentiable one, which will allow you to deal with the fact that, uh, or to, to model that some symbols are closely related as we will see later on. Uh, but one of the things that these uh, systems, these differentiable theorem prover systems do is that, that they induce uh, rules from the end to end proof uh, success. So you, at the end, you have an uh, interpretable output. Uh, and finally, we would like to also understand uh, the expressivity of neural networks, right? So we talk about the fact, or people recently are talking about the fact that uh, neural networks are dealing or are capable to do some reasoning or capture certain type of knowledge. But we really need to understand this from a more uh, in a more principled way, right? So uh, we, want, we want to see exactly which is the kind of knowledge that, that an architect architecture is capturing. And to that aim, we can use uh, well-known results from logic, for example, to transfer results of equivalence of, of incomparability between two different neural networks architectures, or we could simply try to describe the type of regularities that are captured by, uh, by assistance, for example, uh, which kind of rules can be learned from data uh, in a given architecture. So as you see, 
there is uh, the motivation of why we'd like to relate or we would like to study the relationship between uh, neural networks and symbolic knowledge is, uh, I would say, well motivated. Um, and as you see as well, there is a vast amount of work or a vast amount of directions uh, in which you could study this. Um, and the main aim of this uh, tutorial is not really to go in depth in each of these directions, but a little bit to discuss uh, the things that, that some things that have been overview, having an overview of the different things that have been done uh, in some of these directions so that you have an idea. Well, so much for the, for the um, motivation. And the next thing that I want to do is to talk about embeddings of knowledge graphs. So as you, as you have seen, one of the main problems is that knowledge, knowledge graphs are incomplete uh, and it might be difficult just to, 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 to complete them using symbolic uh, methods. In particular, we would like to, to exploit the regularities that occur in the knowledge graphs to, to complete them, right? Uh, I will briefly just recall what a knowledge graph is. Uh, is a graph struct structure knowledge base where knowledge is encoded as relationships between type entities which represent uh, real objects from the world or concepts or subconcepts. Uh, for example, we could describe knowledge saying that uh, Alice is a person as we see here, or we could also describe uh, knowledge saying that Bob is uh, a friend of Alice. As usual, these facts are, could be represented as triples, uh, head, relation, tail. For example, we could describe uh, Paris is a city, right? Which is the one that I have here. Um, just, I just want to stress the, the fact that uh, knowledge graphs are incomplete data sets. So there are many publicly av available knowledge graphs, so let's say Freebase, Wikidata, DBpedia, Jago, et cetera. And the main characteristics of these uh, knowledge graphs is that they are massive. They have millions of nodes. For example, Freebase has uh, around 3 billion triples and they are incomplete. So they many true edges are missing. For example, in Freebase, 93.8% of people don't have uh, nationality. So it's kind of, kind of critical that uh, we don't have this uh, complete knowledge knowledge graph is not that we have just a couple of ages missing. Uh, as you see, the knowledge graph is, is massive. So it's really big, uh, which makes kind of impossible or practically from the practical perspective, impossible to enumerate all possible facts, facts right? So it's really highly intract intractable. So then the main question is, can we predict missing but plausible links within the knowledge graph? Uh, and as I was saying, the main objective, uh, how we want to do this is by exploiting the regularities that occur within the knowledge graph. Uh, the main, the first task that we will look at is the knowledge graph completion task in which given a, a head relation, we want to predict the missing links, right? So uh, I have this very small uh, extract of uh, a knowledge graph that talks about uh, national teams, uh, football national teams, uh, uh, the people that are playing in the teams to for which country they are playing. And imagine that we have the following uh, missing uh, age. So we have Ke Kevin de Bruyne, and uh, we would like to know uh, to which kind of entity is related in the tail by uh, the relation instance of. Right, so this is kind of the knowledge graph task that I have. So I, I give the, the head, which is Kevin de Brune. I have the relation. I want and I want to learn um, what is in the tail. So that, that that is the knowledge graph task. How do I do so? As I was saying, uh, I want to um, exploit the regularities uh, in the information. In particular, uh, we will use embeddings where the main idea is to embed entities in a vector space. So these points that I have here, they, uh, they are vector representations of, of the entities. And these embeddings that I want to learn, they should be such that um, if, a valid if a triple is valid, then the scoring function, this is the scoring function that I, I will, um, give to the system or that I will model, uh, the, the scoring function should be uh, high. So it should be above certain threshold. And if 
if it's below a certain threshold, then that means that the triple is not uh, valid, right? In both cases, uh, it's important to stress that here that I, I, I embed both entities and relations uh, in this uh, aspect of writing this high dimensional space. So what, what is the intuition? What do, would I like to do when I, I, I define this, this, um, these systems? I want to define embeddings in such a way that uh, the embedding of HR is close to the embedding of the tail, right? which is the thing that I, I want to predict, right? So I want to predict whether the embedding, the, the head and the relation, they are joined to which kind of uh, tail. And the main, the main thing here, the main uh, objective or the main question is how do I define this notion of closeness uh, and how do I embed uh, HNR? There has been uh, a lot of work about how to define uh, different models, how to define uh, particular scoring functions and how to embed the entities. Uh, probably this work has been around for the last uh, 10 years. And many, many models have been uh, proposed. Probably the most uh, basic one is uh, trans C, simply because the intuition is just quite natural. So uh, for a triple HRT, we would like to learn embeddings uh, of H, R, and T, which I denoting here with, uh, with the bold, uh, in such a way that if I start with H, I move along R, they, I end up in T. If the given fact is true, else uh, I, the, 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 this translation does not end up in T. So intuitively in the example, if I, if I start with uh, Kevin de Brunet, I want to move along the relation class nationality, which is uh, Belgium, right? So I, I start with Kevin de Brunet, I move along uh, class nationality, and I would like to end up uh, in Belgium. It's important to know that I want this scoring function to work not only for Kevin de Brunet and Belgium, but for any kind of uh, entities that uh, relations that I give. For example, myself, uh, it should work in such a way that if I gave Victor and then I, wa I walk or I traverse across the learn uh, relation uh, nationality, then I end up in uh, Mexico. So uh, intuitively then the scoring function is nothing else that uh, the Euclidean distance between uh, head plus uh, the relation and tail. So this, this is quite natural. Uh, another thing that is important to remark is that um, there have been many, many different variations of this translational model. It's, it's so natural that people have come up with different ways of uh, varying this. So, uh, so trans E and these variances, as we have seen, they use uh, distance as the scoring function. Uh, but of course, nothing prevents us to have a more kind of complex uh, scoring functions. For example, this mode adopts uh, bilinear modeling, which um, basically what it's doing is that is defined by the bilinear product of the embedding of the entities and the relations. In particular, this mode, uh, it describes this by having the, the point-wise uh, product of the head uh, uh, the relation and the tail, and then we sum up and then we get uh, the score, right? And uh, in this case, a triple is going to be valid if it is the case that the, the, the score of this scoring function is high and otherwise it's going to not be valid. So uh, Intuitively, these scoring functions, what, what it's doing is that uh, is defining, uh, you can see this as defining a hyperplane, right? Or you can think of, uh, intuitively, the scoring function can be seen as a cosine similarity between the product of H and R and T, as I have seen here. Uh, well, cosine similarity is nothing else, but uh, then cosine from uh, between two different uh, vectors. Now that I, since I have this hyperplane, I have the possibility of having not only positive and ne negative, uh, not only positive um, a scoring function, uh, a sc a sc 
positive values for the scoring function, but also I could have negative ones, right? So for example, here, the, the value for the scoring function, uh, for, yeah, for value in the scoring function for H and T1 is negative. And I have it in this, in the left-hand side of the hyperplane uh, for H and T2 is positive. So intuitively, we will have then that the triple is going to be valid if the vector that I have in this case, for example, T2, is exactly on, on the side of uh, this normal vector that I have here, H times uh, R, right? And in the other case, it's negative, and, the, and therefore, it's not uh, meant to be valid. Uh, another thing is that um, that I want to, to talk about is that we don't necessarily need to embed in the Euclidean space, right? So this these two first uh, models that I show they they are embedding in the Euclidean space, but of course you could also embed in the complex space, and this is what complexity does, in which uh, they model entities and relations using vectors in the uh, complex space. The scoring function is pretty much as that of this mod, but the only difference is that we take the real part of uh, the scoring function. So uh, in this kind of very, very fast uh, introduction to, to, I would say the main, three of the main uh, models for, for, for embedding, uh, for uh, neural prediction, uh, an important thing that we would like also to, to discuss is the expressivity in terms of the kind of uh, knowledge that these uh, these models can uh, of this these models can capture, right? So we will have that for trans C and its variants, they have several limitations. For example, a relation R can only be modeled if the following uh, conditions are satisfied. For example, a relation R, which is reflexive over some subset S, can only be modeled if R is also symmetric and trans transitive over S. Uh, and we also kind of need to impose this uh, restriction. So in this sense, the trans C and its variants, they cannot model any kind of relation, right? So what they do is that they model certain types of relation, but they impose some other kind of restrictions that are just not natural. This mold uh, can only model symmetric relations. That means that they cannot model uh, anti-symmetric relations. Uh, complexity can correctly model any knowledge graph. OK. Mm. A quick remark. Uh, I just took a quick look at three of the main or uh, four of the main uh, embedding models that have been proposed, but of course there are a ton of models out there. Uh, I simply don't have time to go through all of them. There are many surveys around uh, that you can check, for example, the one that, that I have here. Let, let me now quickly just move to uh, now reasoning over knowledge graphs. So now, more recently, there have been several efforts to do multi-hop reasoning over incomplete massive knowledge graphs. So we are not interested anymore just in one-hop queries, but we are interested in multi-hop queries, so, such as path queries and conjunctive queries. So let's imagine that we have the following knowledge graph that talks about uh, some uh, drugs like Fulvestran and the kind of... Um, causes uh, the kind of advert uh, causes that they have like headache and this how these uh, headache are related these events headache are related with certain pro proteins i will be using this uh, example through the rest of the of the slides so we want to reason once again over incomplete knowledge graphs so the main point is that we cannot traverse just as traditionally we do uh, the knowledge graph to get the answers to complex queries, but we want somehow to implicitly impute the fact that uh, there are missing H's, right? So uh, we can just traverse, but we want to predict this kind of different chains of these missing links while we are doing a prediction, while we are trying to answer a query. And one hop query, we could have, for example, what adverse event is caused by full restaurant. Uh, so what I do is that I start with full strand, then I want to move to learned uh, causes, and I want to see what is at the end of causes. 
I could have also pad queries, like what protein is associated with adverse event caused by fulvestrand. So I start with fulvestrand, then I want to learn causes, and then I want to move uh, along uh, associated with, and I want to check what are the, oh, I want to learn what are the proteins what, that are at the end of that uh, pad. We could also have uh, conjunctive queries, like what are the drugs that treat breast cancer and, cause, and are caused by headache. Uh, in this case, again, we I, I want to start with breast cancer, check what are uh, learned, what are the things that are treated by uh, these drugs. And then I want to move, uh, start from migraine and check what are the, the, the things that are caused by this. Once again, in this case, I don't really want to just traverse the knowledge graph because there are missing links, but I want somehow to have some implicit way of uh, dealing with the fact that there are missing links within the knowledge graph. Uh, one hub queries, uh, they can just be recasted as a, a knowledge graph competition problem. So to answer, is there a link HRT in the knowledge graph is the same as is T an answer to the query HR. So for one hub queries, there is not much else to do. So we can simply look at the, uh, or we can simply use the neural link prediction models that are out there. <clears throat> now let's look at path and conjunctive queries. As I was saying, standard deductive techniques uh, are not useful in this case because there are links missing, links missing, and we we want we will not be able to identify all missing all answers, right? Because there will be missing connections, as 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 we saw in an example before. So what about the following? Can we, can we do first? Uh, knowledge graph completion and then traverse the complete probabilistic knowledge graph? The answer is no, right? Because there are many, many missing uh, relations in the knowledge graph, which this would mean that you will try, you will need to check for each part of entities, whether there is a link missing, and then you will construct a dense graph because many of these uh, links will get not zero probability and suddenly your graph is uh, completely dense. And then the time of, time complexity of traversing a dense graph is exponential in the size of the path length. So because you start moving from one entity, then you need to move to a set of entities uh, and so on. So this idea of kind of first kind of materializing by a, a knowledge graph completion, the, the, the missing links and then doing traversing, it doesn't work on practice. So well, what is the answer to this? So the approach that we want or that people want to develop to answer queries uh, while imputed missing information is some sort of predictive task. So we want to generalize the link prediction task. And how we would like to do this is uh, we would like to just once again use uh, embeddings. We would like to embed queries such that the embedding of the query is close to the answer uh, to the answer embedding of T, right? So if we see this figure, so you could imagine that you have your uh, knowledge graph in which there are missing links, of course, and then you would like to have uh, to learn uh, the embedding of a query in such a way that is close to the answer of the query. Um, yes, uh, as I was saying, this 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 is kind of very very broad. Uh, of course, when dealing with more complex queries, for example, with conjunctive queries, you also need to take into account the fact that they allow for logical operators. Uh, in particular, uh, conjunctive queries include projection and intersection. So the way that they do this is that they um, use ge geometric versions of projection or, of, or intersection, or they use uh, some continuous relaxation of uh, logical operators. And then the, the recipe is then once that you have developed this model, to uh, embed the query and the entities, then traverse the vector space according to the query plan. Uh, let's look at an example of how this works. So we want to embed queries in the vector space. As I was saying, imagine that you have the following query, proteins are associated with adverse events caused by full strand. So I have uh, the following query plan, which is uh, start with full strand, then move along causes, uh, found the elements that, uh, that, that, that are causing these uh, uh, adverse events. And then I move along uh, associated to find the proteins that are associated with uh, these adverse events. So what I do is that I then now I will embed 
So let's imagine that uh, this element that I have here, this is the embedding of a uh, full best strand. Then I want to learn the, the, the relation cost and move along to it in such a way that uh, I end up in this element, right? That I, I, I learn. And the hope is that this element is close to the uh, to those adverse uh, cause adverse causes, right? These uh, adverse events such as uh, short of breath, headaches, brain bleeding, and kidney infection. So you don't really want to materialize, but it should be in a way that this embedding is close to all this set of uh, adverse events. Then once I'm starting here, then I move. Uh, I learned the the the, the relation associate in such a way that uh, I end up here and hopefully I will end up close to the to the answers of the query right so all this is the embedding all this part is the embedding uh, of the query that I have here with the hope that at the end I'm very close to the answers of it this is very rough uh, how how more or less it works and the state of the art the, there have been many many uh, models that have been uh, developed but uh, this is a more recent line of research, right? As I was saying, uh, knowledge graph completion or neural link prediction has been around for the last uh, 10 years. And, uh, and answering uh, or embedding queries started probably in 2018. And since then, uh, uh, some works, a lot of works, interesting works have been uh, put out. Uh, the first uh, model, GQ, it can deal with conjunctive queries, and there the basic idea is to embed into a single point or to embed the, the query into a single point in the Euclidean space, such that the answers are close to the query. Uh, some other model is query to box that works for PEQs, so not only uh, conjunction, but also disjunction, disjunction. And the idea is to embed into a hyper rectangular in the Euclidean space, such that answers uh, are enclosed in the box. Uh, finally, recently, uh, they introduced beta E, which uh, deals with first order related queries. So they also allow for negations. And the basic idea is to embed with beta distribution, distributions and find the, find the answers by measuring the distance. And there are some other models that work, for example, using transformers like BK and some other models like MQL, which, in which they are study the faithfulness of the answers. So with this, I, I finished the, the, the part on uh, embeddings. As we have seen, we can use embeddings for two things, for knowledge graph completion, um, for uh, predicting queries or answering queries over uh, highly incomplete knowledge graphs. Uh, now, uh, Stephen, will talk, we will talk about contextualized knowledge models as knowledge base. Thanks. Hello. Um, so let me try to share my screen. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, so what we're going to do now is, is sort of shift the, the focus a little bit. Um, and um, basically, you know, the, the question um, we want you to think about is where does knowledge come from? Uh, so knowledge graphs are one answer. And, and, and I mean, they are available, but they are not complete. Um, and the other big source of knowledge is, is language, right? Um, we, we have uh, natural language processing systems that can uh, these days, to, to a large extent, understand uh, information that's expressed in, in, in language. And so the question is, can we somehow exploit that knowledge? What kind of knowledge do these models learn and, and so on? Um, so contextualized language models um, are sort of the, the, the current state of the art, uh, let's say, in, in language understanding. Um, before I explain what these models are and, and, and then what are the kinds of knowledge that these models capture. Let me just give you a sort of a very, very uh, quick um, overview of sort of the, the, the latest stages in the natural language processing community. So a long time ago, um, which means sort of uh, until 2012, maybe, um, if you wanted to do uh, natural language processing, for example, if you wanted to, to do um, a text classifier, like a sentiment classifier, Essentially, what you would do is, is uh, treat the words in a document as symbols, represent a document um, typically by the number of times each word occurs, and then train uh, some kind of classifier. So typically, people would use an SVM or an naive base classifier. Um, and um, well, the difficulty is that um, 
to, for example, here to, to implement your sentiment classifier, um, you need a system that, first of all, has to learn the meaning of the words in, in, in language, and then it has to solve or learn how to solve the actual task. Um, so as a result of that, if you wanted to, to train a good sentiment classifier, you needed a lot of training data. Um, and then a first sort of breakthrough um, came with the sort of the popularity of uh, vector space representations of word meaning um, that, that especially became popularized with the word to vec uh, model um, that, that sort of, yeah, was able to scale up the, this, this idea of, of learning vector representations of words to very, very large uh, text collections. So I'm assuming that that most of you, probably all of you, uh, will be at least somewhat familiar with, with sort of the idea of word to vec. Um, but just in summary, the idea is that you know, we're going to represent every word as a um, relatively low dimensional vector. So low dimensional means typically around 300 dimensions. Now, 300 is referred to as low dimensional because what happened before word to vec was that you would basically represent your documents as a frequency vector where the number of dimensions was the number of words in the language. So you would have maybe 100,000 dimensions. Now a, a word is, is 300 dimensions. And uh, I'm not going to go into any details, but, but the idea is that the similarity of these vectors represents the similarity uh, of word meaning. Right? So here, uh, if, if you like this, there's this um, uh, projector uh, .tensorflow.org online system where you can play with, with, with these uh, vectors. Uh, I just tried a few uh, examples. So ontologies, uh, you can see here the, the, the top. Um, I mean, this, this is an interactive visualization, so it, it's not very informative if you look at it uh, like this, but it, you can play with the system to, to try to understand a little bit what, what is going on in that vector space. Um, but you can see here the nearest neighbors in, in the vector space. So, so the words that have the closest meaning to ontologies. Um, it, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not great, um, which is a result of the fact that the word ontologies is not extremely frequent in, in the text collections that were used for training these vectors, but, but they are quite meaningful. I mean, AAAI is, is obviously to some extent relevant. Um, Lenat Doug Lenat and um, the, obviously the, 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 the person behind Psych and, and the Psych ontology here uh, as well. And obviously so some other names that maybe uh, you might recognize. Here's another example, rules. Um, then here we see quite uh, nice, um, I mean, they're, they're not from KR, but, but, but they're meaningful uh, neighbors. So the most similar words, according to the learned fact representation of rules is laws, procedures, guidelines, regulations, and, and so on. So um, the, the important thing about these word vectors is that they are learned without any explicit training data. They are learned based on uh, word co-occurrence in a large text collection. Uh, so that's sort of meaning that, that you get essentially for free, at least not in terms of computation time, but for free in terms of manual effort. And, and there's more, I mean, um, one of the, the often hyped um, uh, features of word vectors is that there is a lot of structure in these vector spaces. So it's not just that they capture similarity, um, but they also capture relational structure to some extent. Um, and the idea here is that, um, you know, the, the vector between a country and its capital, uh, for example, is relatively uh, stable. So, so the vector that connects China with Beijing is quite similar to the vector that connects, uh, I don't know, Poland with Warsaw and, and, and the other uh, country capital pairs. Um, so, I mean, th this already showed the idea that we can have um, non-trivial amounts of, of knowledge that is learned by these models, uh, and often e even knowledge that is not explicitly asserted in the text collection you're starting from. So it's a sort of emerging uh, knowledge. Okay, so let, let's, uh, oh no, um, so, so j just to, to sort of highlight how word vectors were used then to train, for example, again, a, a, a text classifier. So now, um, you know, a, a, the input sentence becomes a sequence of word vectors. So every word in the sequence is represented as a vector. So sentence is a sequence of vectors. And then people were training uh, some kind of neural network model to manipulate that sequence of vector uh, into a final uh, prediction. So an LSTM model uh, it would be a typical um, uh, approach to take. And so the, the idea here is that uh, word meaning is pre-trained, right? So, so we start from pre-trained word vectors. So now, rather than just, I mean, than before where the model had to learn meaning and so learn how to solve the task, now, um, well, what, what we still need to learn is, is how, you know, the, the different words are composed to, to sort of 
um, the, the, the sentence level. So we have to learn how to compose word meaning to get sentence level um, meaning. Steven, you have a question. Yes. Uh, can, can I say, uh, just curious to know why word ontologies was more closer to such a play than word ontology in the same list. Um, so, I, I mean, we have to guess, right? So the, the, the reason, uh, strictly speaking, is that the, the, the pattern of words that, that tend to co-occur with the word ontologies happens to be more similar to the pattern of, of uh, co-occurring words with the word AAA. Um, but I have a, a, a good intuition, I think, here about what, what might be going on, because there's a reason why I put the word ontologies and not the word ontology, because the word ontology obviously is used in, in, in philosophy uh, with, with a meaning that's quite different from the meaning in KR. And, and so if you look on, on Wikipedia, um, that most mentions of ontology are probably not referring to the KR meaning of ontology. Um, uh, whereas ontologies in, in plural um, uh, is, I think, almost exclusively uh, referring to the KR meaning. Uh, and so I think that, that, that this is uh, the reason why ontology and ontologies are um, yeah, not as, as similar as, as maybe you might expect. Um, all right. Um, and so, so, so uh, what happened in this sort of phase of natural language processing is that we have these word vectors and then the focus started to shift to how do we design neural network architectures to solve tasks and, and these neural network architectures, they became, became increasingly complex. So this is a schematic overview of a model that's called BIDAF, that, that was a standard reading comprehension model. So uh, the input here is uh, a piece of text, a paragraph, news story, something like this, and a natural language question. And the output is the answer to the question. It was always the case that the answer had to be mentioned literally in, in, the, in the inputs. And so it was yeah, encoded as the start position and the end position. And um, I, I'm not gonna go into any sort of detail, but um, just to emphasize that model architectures became increasingly more complicated. And a lot of work in natural language processing, processing was about designing or engineering the, the, these uh, model architectures. Okay, so that was first sort of, paradigm shift is going to, to word vectors. Now contextualized language models, which I would argue are a similarly uh, important paradigm shift to the introduction of word vectors. So the idea here is that still, we are going to represent a sentence uh, as a sequence of word vectors. Uh, so that, that, that remains the same. But now we're going to train this deep neural network um, on um, I mean, without explicit supervision. So we have a, a deep network using something called transformer layers. It doesn't really matter um, here um, what, um, what, I mean, how they exactly work. But the idea is that we have a sentence, which is a sequence of word vectors, which is being transformed by these um, many, many uh, neural network layers, typically either 12 or 24 in most models. And then what, what, what we get at the, out, uh, at the output here is again, a sequence of word vectors, where the intuition is that um, the, a word vector in the output represents the meaning of the corresponding word in the context of that particular sentence. Um, so, so it's a contextualized meaning. And, and so the idea is that we go from uh, each word having its individual meaning to essentially a, a, a representation of meaning at the sentence level. Now, the key trick is that, as I mentioned, these very deep neural networks are trained without any explicit supervision. And the way uh, this works is that you take a sentence from your text collection, let's say Wikipedia, and you replace one of the words um, but by a, a mask, right? So you hide what is the word that is there in the sentence. And you train your neural network to predict which is the word that was masked, right? And, and so you have very sort of a complicated um, architecture, well, it's not complicated, but, but a lot of uh, parameters of all these many neural network layers that are being trained to try to predict what is the word being masked. And, and because you don't need explicit supervision, but you can uh, apply this trick to any sentence in, in that you can find on the web. So, so the amount of pos possible training data that you have is almost endless. And, and these models are being trained with very significant hardware resources. And if you do that, um, it turns out that these models converge in a way that um, is, is quite remarkable, right? So, so, so these models without explicit training data seem to develop an understanding of well, word meaning, first of all, uh, but also syntax that they, they learn 
uh, grammar rule that they learn how to construct grammatically uh, correct sentences. And most crucially um, for, for this uh, tutorial, they learn a lot of world knowledge, factual knowledge, as well as common sense knowledge. Um, and then, you know, we're not going to focus on, on this, but, but, but from a natural language processing um, point of view, the significance is that you take this pre-trained uh, language model, uh, which you can just download, so it's a no effort required. And then if you want to solve a particular task, you simply add a very basic classifier on top of this network. And then uh, you, you fine tune the classifier and that um, uh, neural network uh, to solve your task. And because now we don't just have pre-trained word meaning, we have really pre-trained capabilities to understand sentences and to, to have knowledge about the world. Uh, you can start to train very effective natural language processing models with, well, first of all, very little effort because you don't have to design complicated neural networks architectures anymore. And also very few training examples because your model, it, it only had, you essentially you only have to tell the neural network what is the task you wanted to solve, but you don't have to teach it about um, you know, the meaning of language anymore. Um, so for engineering a new type of model, what is the thought uh, process? Um, so that's, a, I think if I understand this question correctly, um, sort of what I just explained, right? So, so you no longer uh, try to sort of design a custom neural network architectures for each task. You have the single uh, transformer layer stack and, and then you, you do something very simple and usually that's enough. Um, so um, if, if you want to, um, for, so for sentiment classification, it would just be like, like a single classification layer that you add on top of uh, uh, the, the output layer. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back to, to, um, to, to this sort of um, question of how you, you can approach different types of tasks uh, a, a bit further on in, in, in the, in the uh, tutorial as well. Um, so um, because the focus here is, is now on knowledge, right? So, so the, the, the interesting thing about um, these language models from a KR point of view is that they, yeah, they capture a lot of knowledge. And it turns out that you can extract a lot of that knowledge without any need for training data. So you take a model, a pre-trained model that was just trained on that sort of predicting what's the, the word being masked. And suppose you want to, to, to solve the, the, the query, what is the capital of France? Well, uh, it turns out that you simply put the sentence, the capital of France is, and then that mask token, you feed it to your, to, your, to your model, and then the output vector, which conceptually uh, encodes a probability distribution over word vectors, corresponds to well, a probability distribution whose most likely uh, word is, is the word Paris. Right? So, so you, you put uh, the capital of France is mask, and out comes um, you know, the, the correct answer, Paris, as if by magic. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that the significance of this is that you don't have to train your system to, 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 to do this. It, it, it already comes uh, for free. And it's not perfect, obviously, but um, the amount of knowledge that is captured in this way is, is quite remarkable. Um, now, one caveat is that um, how successful this is, how accurate the answers uh, that you're going to get are going to be, it depends a lot on, on how you frame this um, input. So the capital of France is mask is one way of, of putting it, um, but there are many different ways in language that you can use to express that, you know, that you're looking for the capital of France. Uh, and it turns out that how you exactly formulate the, the inputs, it's, it matters a lot. So what is happening now in, in sort of natural language processing is that um, there's been a shift from engineering the model architecture of your neural network to engineering um, how you frame the input. So that's, this is known as the prompts, the prompt of your language model, how you frame the inputs to, to get the language model to output what you want. Um, and there have been uh, quite a lot of models now uh, or methods to try to automatically come up with, with a good template, uh, that you, a good prompts that you can use uh, to get particular type of knowledge. So for example, if you knew that, uh, you know, you really wanted to, to find out capitals of cities, and you already have some training examples of, of uh, countries, uh, sorry, uh, capitals of countries, of course, uh, countries and their capital. And you can uh, basically train a, a model to, to find the prompt that is most likely to give you the correct answer. So now we're back to training, but the thing to emphasize here is that the language model itself is frozen. So, so, so you don't touch it at all. The only thing that is being optimized 
based on your training data is the actual prompt. So the, the, the sequence of words that you use to tell the model that, um, well, you're looking after the, uh, the capital of whatever city is mentioned here at this position. Um, and ju just to, to, to highlight um, what an impact that can make. Um, so here is, so, so LAMA is, is a benchmark that was used uh, to introduce to, to yeah, check how accurately language models can predict this kind of factual knowledge. Um, if this is, yeah, if, if you don't know these metrics, and um, don't worry about that too much, um, higher is better, right? And, and they, they range from one from zero to one hundred. Uh, so this this llama, this this is the the, the naive methods uh, with sort of manually defined sentences like the capital of France is mask, and this is sort of the improvement you get after you try to automatically optimize the prompts based on some training examples, and, and so you can see quite a remarkable. Uh, improvement, which, which shows that that indeed how you frame the prompt is is important. Okay, so um, since this initial work, um, I mean, a lot of authors have looked at you know, trying to understand exactly what is the kind of knowledge that um, these language models capture, and often also, you know, how how can we break that? Right? How can we um, what, what is the kind of knowledge that they really don't capture? Now, um, one particular problem is um, when you have a sentence that is sort of looking for quite unusual things, right? So, um, so this, this is a, a benchmark that, that's tried to um, probe for, for common sense knowledge. So, so the input is a dish with strawberries, then the mass token contains tuna. And um, what, what you're looking for is, so, so the, at the position of the mask token, you get a probability distribution from your language model. And you're looking at which of these five words has the highest probability according to your language model. Never, rarely, sometimes, often, always. Um, whoops. Um, and of course, what uh, we're after is, is behavior that's consistent with what we as humans would, would predict, right? So a dish with strawberries, uh, in this case, uh, never contains tuna. And that, that doesn't make any sense. So it's probing for a particular type of common sense knowledge by checking whether the language model understands that in this sentence, the correct answer is, is never, or perhaps rarely, but definitely not you know, always or often. Um, and it turns out that um, language models, without fine tuning, right? So this is the pre-trained language model, as you get it after training it on your text collection, uh, how much does it understand about these common sense uh, things? And, and so you can see that the results here, random guessing is 20% accuracy, right? Because you have five options. So, and one of them is correct. And so all of these popular language models actually do worse than, uh, worse than random. So they have certain preferences, certain biases that, that actually um, are counter uh, productive. So, so, that, that, that's, um, so, so they, they don't capture that kind of common sense knowledge at all. And, and as I mentioned, but just to emphasize, the main reason intuitively is that um, this is not a sentence that you would find in a text collection. These models are trained by learning to predict or, or complete the type of sentences that, that people would normally write. This is not a sentence you would normally write. And, and, and that's what they struggle with. Here's another example um, that is designed to, to look at numerical reasoning. So, a 25 year old person age is mask than a 38 year old person. So that, that's the prompt they use. And they look at whether which of these two words has higher probability uh, in the vector, uh, the probability distribution that, that, that's predicted for, for this position of the input. So younger or older. And obviously, um, depending on, on which numbers you put here, one of them is going to be correct, right? So the output of, of the language model is shown schematically here. But basically, the, the idea is that uh, everything below the uh, main diagonal is, is correct, right? So, so uh, for 20, um, we're looking at what are the ages that are considered to be uh, older than 20 by the language model, right? So these, these are correct. So you can see it's not perfectly the main diagonal. So there are a couple of mistakes, um, but most of, of the answers are correct. And where there are mistakes, it's for ages that are really quite similar. So it means that the language model has not learned the precise meaning of the numbers perhaps, but it has a good grasp of the order of magnitude of the numbers. So it knows that 30 is more than, than 25, for example. Um, but then um, the point is that this only works if you put in um, <clears throat> numbers that are in typical age range. If you write something like this, uh, 
1980 year old person age is younger or older than a 1988 year old person. Um, you know, again, that's not something you would typically encounter in a text collection. Um, and it completely, completely messes up the language model. So it always predicts um, we have one of the two options, let's say younger. Um, so another example where, you know, on sort of typical inputs, um, the language model exhibits a lot of common sense knowledge. Um, but as soon as you sort of deviate a little bit from what you would normally write, it, it, it struggles. Um, okay. Now, um, in terms of um, applications, an obvious um, um, yeah, area of, of, of applications is again to look at knowledge space completion. Um, and a particular focus has been on uh, completing common sense knowledge base. Now, the problem with common sense knowledge bases, uh, like uh, concept nets and uh, atomic, um, is that often the, the entities that you have to predict are phrases. So they're not uh, sort of particular words or, or named entities, they're, they are phrases. And because they are specific phrases, often they appear uh, very infrequently in your knowledge graph. Often they are even uh, unique. So traditional methods for knowledge graph completion don't work very well or aren't even suitable because you, know, you, you can't predict unique uh, entities with, with its model like trans or dist And um, But what, what, what you do is, is, is this, right? Uh, you train a, a, a language model on a, um, an encoding of the triples, right? So, so um, um, in, in, in Atomic, we have the triple person X goes to the mall, is in the relation X intent with the uh, tail entity to buy uh, clothes, right? And so, so the intention of going to the mall is sometimes to buy clothes. So, so you, you encode these triples as a sort of sentence, and then you train the language. So, so you start with a pre-trained language model that was trained on Wikipedia, for example. And then you fine tune your language model to learn specifically to complete triples like that. I mean, sentence encodings of, of triples. Uh, this the same thing here with, with, with concept nets. They, they use a slightly different encoding here. Uh, but but uh, yeah, so you have the triple go to the mall, has prerequisite, have money. And um, so that, that's a triple from concept nets. You, you, you put it in a sort of sentence structure and you, you fine tune your language model on these kind of triples. And then once you have that fine tuned language model, then you use it to predict, uh, well, to do link prediction, uh, basically, right? So, so you, you put uh, one entity, you put the relation, and then here uh, you put masks and you get the language model to, to complete that uh, masked part of, of, of the triple. And, and it sort of, um, yeah, it gives you meaningful things. So here um, is some, some examples from the, from, from the paper, uh, the comment paper. Um, and, um, you know, th th there's a lot of, um, they're not all correct. There's a bit of noise. Uh, but a lot of very meaningful triples are being generated by uh, the language model. And, and so these are all triples that are uh, new, that are not in the original uh, common sense knowledge graphs. Um, so so the, the model is, is predicting new knowledge. Now, uh, there's been some discussion about how new that knowledge really is, to what extent it's mostly learning reformulations of, of things that are very similar to, to what is already in the knowledge graph versus really learning new common sense knowledge, but still the, 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 the point is that you, you get triples that, that's, um, uh, that are not in your original knowledge graph uh, because of, um, well, knowledge that, that essentially comes from your pre-trained language model rather than sort of from statistical regularities like in a traditional knowledge graph completion model. Okay, so there's a question. Uh, yeah. And that the applications suffer from the problem of word ambiguity from different domains, different meanings of the word ontology could be a good example. Do knowledge graph embeddings face the same problems in the sense of symbol ambiguity or concept ambiguity? How do they deal with such problems? Um, so for, for knowledge graph, um, standard knowledge graph completion, uh, it depends on, on, on the knowledge graph. So if you have something like Wikidata, Wikidata is disambiguated. Each entity has a unique uh, meaning. Uh, concept nets, is not disambiguated. So there, uh, the problem of ambiguities is very much there. So the word apple, you know, will appear as, as a fruit and as a company, and there's no attempt at disambiguation. Um, so so the, yeah, the, the, there's no disambiguation and, and the models don't explicitly uh, deal with that. In general, these language models are very good at inferring the correct meaning of an ambiguous word from the sentence context. So, so outside of sort of knowledge graph completion, if you have a sentence with an ambiguous word, the difference between sort of the, if I go back to um, 
the, 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 the difference between the input vectors here and the output vectors is often precisely that sort of disambiguation uh, process, right? So you, you, know, you have the word apple here. Um, so that's sort of a superposition of, of the different meanings of apple. Uh, but then at the outputs, you have representation of the meaning of apple that is sort of used in that particular sentence. Um, so it's um, reasonable to assume that um, in, in these sort of applications where you train the model um, on, um, on, on, on uh, ambiguous knowledge graphs, that um, to some extent, they should also be able to sort of um, disambiguate the, the, the meaning of, of uh, ambiguous concepts if the, the, the relation um, type that, that you mean, uh, that you put as, as part of the input is only meaningful for maybe one of the particular uh, me, uh, yeah, meanings of, of that concept. All right. Um, so yeah, so, so, so as I mentioned, um, there's a specific motivation for using language models for common sense knowledge graphs because of the particular nature of, of these uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, but people have also uh, tr tried similar ideas for um, standard uh, knowledge graphs, so, so uh, Freebase, um, for example. Uh, similar idea, so, so you encode the triple as a sentence, so you have some special tokens uh, to, to, to sort of uh, use as separators between the heads, the relation, and the tail element of your knowledge graph triple. And in this case, the, the language model uh, is, is fine-tuned to uh, predict a, a confidence score uh, given uh, as input to complete triple. Um, and, and there's variations uh, where they do link prediction as well, where you, you um, put the, the head entity in the relation and you train the model to predict the tail entity. Um, but, but here, so you have a question. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so for contest knowledge graph completion, can we include, for example, smiley uh, of different expression to uh, generate meaningful data? I, could, could you clarify? I'm not sure I, I understand the question. Um, so yeah, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll continue, uh, and then uh, if you could clarify the question, I'll, I'll come back to that question in, in a minute. Um, so um, yeah, so, so we're trying to predict uh, the probability that the given triple is, is accurate, um, and, and surprisingly, it, it works really well. So here's a comparison with a number of standard methods on our three uh, standard benchmarks. And you can see that, especially in mean rank, so that, that's on average how far in, in, in the list of, of predictions is the uh, is the correct uh, answer. No, that doesn't make anyway. Um, you know, it, it, it works quite well. And the, why this is remarkable is because this is a model that was not designed for knowledge graph completion. We really. just have a have a sort of linearization of the triple, so, so some kind of sentence encoding. You put a classifier on, or, or a regressor on, on top of the model, and that's it. You, you don't try to design anything to, to, to work um, well for knowledge graph completion. Um, right. Um, so um, there's also been work on, on, on question answering. So, so um, um, for example, using this model called uh, T5. So T5 is, is, a, is another variant of, of is, is a language model. It's trained slightly differently from um, uh, from BERT, the, the, the model I explained before. Uh, so here in the pre-training, you take a sentence, you uh, mask a, a, a phrase, uh, so not just a word, but, but a phrase, and the model is trained to predict here the missing phrase, right? Uh, so so it, it sort of, uh, it's a sort of input-output model um, that, that predicts missing phrases. And it turns out that this sort of input-output or encoder-decoder uh, model it works very well uh, for question answering. So once that model has been pre-trained, what you do is you, you fine tune it on question answer pairs. So when was Franklin D. Roosevelt born? 1982. Uh, so you, you train it, uh, and, and but by training it like this, um, what you're doing is, is you, you're telling the model that you want it to answer questions, right? Um, but then uh, it turns out that after you, you fine tune the model like this, you can actually use it to uh, also answer different questions. Questions that need specific factual knowledge 
that, it, that you haven't given it during training. So, so the point is that, again, even though there's no explicit supervision really going on, this model learns, I mean, a, a lot of, of, of world knowledge. Um, but in this case, the focus is on, on factual world knowledge. Uh, and in fact, uh, so in, in this paper, they um, compared this, this T5 model uh, that, that works in the way that I explained, with models that actually um, retrieve relevant um, passages. So, so, so the, the classical approach to question answering is you have the question, from the question, you, you find relevant documents on the web that are likely to contain the answer. You extract these documents and then you, you feed these documents through uh, some kind of neural uh, network model that tries to extract the answers from the, the, the relevant documents that you just found. So that's an open book question answering because your question answering model doesn't need to have any knowledge. It just needs to learn how to identify the answer in a document that contains the answer. Um, whereas what the T5 model is doing is, is what is known as closed book question answering, is that uh, it doesn't use any external knowledge at all. And it turns out that actually it, it does as well as um, you know, the, the, the best uh, open book model. So that means that all the knowledge that you need for, for answering questions in, in these particular benchmarks, essentially the model already has that knowledge after, uh, after that particular pre-training task. So again, evidence that, that these models capture a lot of, of, uh, a lot of knowledge. Um, oh, okay, so, so can we also consider text short forms to generate triples, for example, uh, PLZ uh, instead of please? Um, so, so um, I mean, yes, I mean, the, the model will, will generalize. How effectively uh, the model would understand something like PLZ instead of please, it would depend a lot on, on what inputs you use for training that model. If you train your model on Wikipedia, it may not have a good understanding of what PLZ means. But if you train it on Twitter, for example, then it should know very well that, that PLZ is, is basically the same as please. Um, so there have been, uh, since the, so the original model, the BERT was trained on, on Wikipedia and a corpus of book and uh, movie reviews or, 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 or uh, transcripts. Um, but since then, there have been variants of these language models that were pre-trained on, on large collections of tweets uh, or on uh, data from particular domains. There's a lot of specific models in a medical domain, for example, trained on, on clinical notes or, or um, uh, PubMed abstracts. Uh, and, and so depending on what document collection you use during your, your, your preaching of your language model, it will come with, with an understanding of, of slang words or, or, or whatever um, um, you know, terminology you want the model to capture. Um, all right, and then, um, as the sort of the, the final uh, point of this part of the um, of the tutorial, and then uh, I think we'll have a, a break. Uh, I just want to give this example of, of GPT-3. Now, GPT-3 is you know, yet another language model, uh, but what sets it apart is um, the fact that it's huge. It has 175 billion parameters. It's sort of really um, at, at the limits of, of what is possible with sort of brute force training of these language models. So it's, it's a huge, huge model. Uh, it's extremely impressive. And so here's an, an example. So this model is, is trained specifically to complete uh, sentences or, or paragraphs. So, so you give it the beginning of a sentence or a paragraph, and then it, it continues right. So it's different from BERT, where you predict masked words in the middle of a sentence. It, it, it sort of continues where, where you start off. Um, so this is the input given to the model, right? And again, this is not fine-tuned on any particular explicit training data. Just you train it on, 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 a, on a large, text collection, and it does the following. So the input you give it is, is this. At the party, I poured myself a glass of lemonade, but it turned out to be too so sour. So I added a little sugar. I didn't see a spoon handy, so I started with the cookie. But that turned out to be a bad idea because, okay? And, and then, as this is the, the, the prompt, the input, and then you ask this language model to complete uh, your story. And uh, so this is what it comes up with. Because the cookie crumbled and made the lemonade cloudy. So I tried to fish out the crumbs with a fork, but I couldn't get them all, and I ended up drinking a lot of crumbs. So that's, I would say, extremely re remarkable. It, it shows a, a rather solid understanding of a number of common sense uh, aspects to the story. That, you know, what, what happens if you put a cookie in lemonade? Uh, what, what can you do or, or not with, with a fork? Um, and, and so it, it, it's quite uh, remarkable. One of the most um, hyped aspects, I would say, of this model is that also, it learns to do tasks 
um, by looking at the input. So previously with the older language models, if you wanted it to answer questions, you had to sort of train it on question answering pairs. But with GPT-3, you take the model as it is, and as part of the input, uh, you, you sort of tell the model what it is that you want to want it to do. So here you say Q, and then a question, A, and then the answer to the question. You have, give a couple of examples like that. Then you put Q, the question, and then you let the model continue. And the model picks up the fact that what you wanted to do is answer that question, even though it has not been trained for that purpose. Uh, so this is, again, remarkable. What's also remarkable is you know, the, the, the ability to, to answer in a meaningful way. So in this particular question, what is your favorite animal? So this is all part of the input, right? So what is your favorite animal? GPT-3 answers, uh, my favorite animal is a dog. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, but then, so this conversation continues. Uh, each of the, 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 the things in bold is, you know, GPT-3 that continues. The things not in bold is sort of the, the, the person having the dialogue that types the question. Right? So why? Because dogs are loyal and friendly. Okay, so then we try to be, um, I say we, it, it, so, so then it wasn't, it wasn't me who did it. Uh, what are the two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood? Well, two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood are if it is hungry or if it is hot. How many eyes does a giraffe have? Two eyes. How many legs does a frog have? Four legs. Are there anim animals with three legs? No, there are no animals with three legs. Why don't animals have three legs? Animals don't have three legs because they would fall over. So pretty, pretty reasonable for a system that has not been trained at all to answer questions, let alone um, questions that involve common sense. Uh, the, the way to sort of trip it up is again to give very unusual inputs, right? So how many eyes does my foot have? Um, and then the models just start guessing. Oh, your foot has two eyes. Um, and then it just gets crazy. My favorite one is this. Uh, how many rainbows does it take to jump from Hawaii to 17? Apparently, it takes two rainbows. Um, so this is sort of the clear weakness of these language models. They cannot deal with unusual inputs. And uh, from the way they behave, you cannot really work out whether they know the answer and they give you something meaningful or whether they're just hallucinating and, and giving you something, uh, something random. All right, so I think this is a good point um, to, to have a, a little break. Um, and um, so, so shall we say maybe 10, 10 minutes? Um, and then we'll continue uh, with, uh, to talk about language models, but we'll look at um, sort of reasoning and, and rule knowledge rather than, than just factual knowledge. Okay, so I, I would suggest we uh, yeah, continue. Well, here in the UK, five past five, um, and I guess for most of you, it will be five past uh, six. Thanks. So this was supposed to be the, this was supposed to be the, the middle of the lecture, so we're a little bit behind schedule, uh, but that's okay. We, we we can skip some things, and um, um, yeah, we'll just see where we get. Okay, so so um, what I want to talk about now is is yeah reasoning and rules, right? Because um, I mean the, the broader question really is is sort of yeah what is the right way to to learn uh, knowledge, knowledge not just facts but but also generic knowledge. And, and uh, do, do, uh, when and in what context and for what reasons do we need symbolic uh, encodings of knowledge rather than sort of something that's hidden in a neural network? Um, now, the question of how well these language models can reason is difficult to answer, right? Because it, it depends on, on, on how exactly you, you set up the task. So I'll just give an overview of a number of works that have been done to, to analyze this question. So here's the, the typical sort of probing task that we saw before the break. Uh, so A is made out of glass and B is made out of stone. So A is blank 
uh, transparent. And, and we look at whether the probability of more is higher or the probability or less is higher. And, and if a model has learned to, to apply common sense reasoning, uh, you would expect that it, it can correctly answer these kinds of questions, right? Uh, and it turns out that it's not the case. It, it, basically, um, existing models are ran random guessing, uh, are doing random guessing. Um, now, the caveat here is that, again, these are very unusual things, right? That this is not something that we would typically write. And, and, and we know that the language models struggle with unusual uh, inputs. Um, so something else that people have done is actually train a language model, the transformer-based architecture from scratch, but rather than training it on Wikipedia, train it on a synthetic corpus of, of triples, sort of knowledge graph-like triples. And triples that have been generated in accordance with certain rules. So you know the rules, you come up with the rules, you generate the triples in accordance to the rules, and then you can verify to what extent your language model that you train on that synthetic corpus is able to apply these rules, right? So what are these rules? Uh, simple things, uh, equivalence, right? So it's two relations meaning the same thing, R and S. Symmetry, uh, so uh, if you swap head and tail entity, is the triple still valid? Um, inversion, if you swap head and tail entity, is there another relation that you can put there that, that makes triple valid? Negation, okay. Um, implication, um, and uh, so as uh, just entailment. And, and composition, which is, I mean, one I guess we're mostly interested in is, is sort of rule knowledge, right? Is, is the, the model able to, to learn basic um, data log rules? Um, and so, so what they do is, is so they, 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 they have the, the initial triples, they apply the rules, so you have the closure, uh, but the inferred facts, they split into training and test training. They are added to the, the, the text collection that is used for training the language model. Test is, is, is used to check um, the, um, the, the, the generalization abilities of the model. So here are the results. Train is if we uh, check how, how, uh, what the language model believes. If you look at facts that it had, has actually seen during training. And as you can see, these models can memorize pretty much everything they've seen in training. So no problems there. But the real question is, is these test examples, right? Can the models infer things uh, based on, on rules they have seen over and over again during training? And so the answer depends a lot on, on the type of rule we're talking about. Symmetry and equivalence, uh, basically they, they, they capture. Uh, but composition, which is sort of rules, you can see accuracy is pretty much zero. So, so that they are not able to learn uh, that kind of rule knowledge, at least not in you know, this particular setting. Um, and there's also yeah, an interesting point in the paper that yes, the results for symmetry are very good, but actually for some reason, this language model BERT has a preference for things to be symmetric. So even if you start with anti-symmetric relations, BERT will actually think it's symmetric and it just makes everything symmetric. Uh, so, so it's performing well here, but, but that's you know because it somehow has this preference for things being symmetric. And um, so standard sort of um, reasoning. So here, the idea is that we train the model on, on text fragments like this. A uh, bunch of facts, a bunch of rules. So basic if-then rules. Uh, so basic mode exponents reasoning, but, but chains. And, and then you know, uh, we get the, the, the model to answer questions that require chaining sort of these rules, right? Um, and um, so, 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 so you, you, of course, these, these are synthetically generated text documents, so we can generate a lot. Uh, we can train the model and then we see whether it generalizes to, um, to, to cases it hasn't seen during training. Um, the, the, the points, the key points that is being analyzed here is whether um, the model generalizes in terms of the number of inference steps. So what you can see here is, um, for example, here, model two was trained on examples that needed at most two inference steps in sort of the chaining the, the modus ponens uh, rules. Um, and what you can see is that it is successfully generalizing that reasoning behavior as long as the number of inference steps doesn't increase. But if you need more inference steps, it, it's sort of, it doesn't fail completely, but, but, but it, it starts to underperform significantly. So it is possible to sort of teach the model to apply modus ponens in these very synthetic settings. Um, but generalizing the number of inference steps is, is harder. Um, so something else that, again, moving away a little bit from synthetic examples uh, that, that has been observed is that these models struggle a lot uh, to combine things from different sentences. So here's, a, here's a, a benchmark where you have two sentences and you have to complete the second sentence. But to do it, to, to find the correct answer, 
you need the context that's provided by the first sentence. So here, Pablo wanted to cut the lumber he had bought to make some sh shelves. He asked his neighbor if he could borrow her. Um, and okay, so it's not, not very difficult to guess that we want something like saw. Uh, but what Bert is, uh, this language model is basically doing is it, it, it ignores the first sentence completely. And it just puts words that are plausible um, if you only look at, at the second sentence. So if he could borrow her car. Um, and and um, yeah, maybe I'll skip this. There's a number of other examples that there's many more in, in the paper, um, which basically all confirm the same idea that, that you know that this language model is, is completing the sentence in a plausible way, but it doesn't uh, learn to, to apply the, the context that's provided in the first sentence that actually matters for, for the, the, the kind of common sense reasoning uh, that we need here. Um, knowledge graph completion um, has also been studied. So, we looked at, at knowledge graph completion in the sense of directly scoring triples. Uh, what they do here is actually learning uh, whether um, a triple follows from a certain, uh, so, so you have a certain path in, in the knowledge graph that connects two entities, Franklin Roosevelt and Washington DC here. And so can we train BERT to, to recognize that um, th this path entails this triple? Uh, and this is used in particular for inductive knowledge graph completion. So that means that the entities that you want to apply this inference pattern to are different from the entities that, that the model has seen during training. Um, and um, the, the answer is that yes, the, 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 actually this works remarkably well. Um, so, so one of the mo better known benchmarks is GRAIL and so for, for this inductive knowledge graph completion setting. So GRAIL uses graph neural networks to learn these inference patterns. Um, and um, yeah, somehow, you know, even though it, it's a type of reasoning that this language model um, seems to be quite successful. Of course, we don't know uh, whether it's how much its success depends on, on its ability to reason and how much its success really depends because it just has a lot of prior knowledge about these, um, these entities. Okay, so that um, sort of finishes the, the story about uh, language models. The story is not complete, right? There's no definitive answer, I would say, to, to, to the question how much knowledge these models are really capturing, how much rule knowledge, how much reasoning they're able to do. Um, but um, yeah, to, yeah, to be continued, let, let, let's leave it there. So the next topic, um, we're going to look again at symbolic rules. And so um, look at what role symbolic rules or, or, or um, something that looks like a symbolic rule can, can play in combination with neural networks. And um, so the first example, I mean, Victor already, uh, briefly explained in the introduction um, is, is to do sort of soft unification, right? So here we have a, a logic program um, and we have a query, but, but the terminology of the query is slightly different from uh, the terminology in your logic program. Uh, so instead of grandfather off, we have grandpa off. So traditional prologue obviously fails. Um, so this is very much motivated from applications in natural language processing again, where um, you know, the predicates would correspond to words in natural language and uh, you may not have exact matches. Um, and the idea here is that, okay, traditional prolog fails, but what if we have a vector representation of the different predicates and the different um, individuals? Uh, and what if, if that vector representation tells us that grandfather of and grandpa of are very similar relations? Uh, so then um, essentially what, what we do is we have this sort of soft unification that tells us that, um, well, we're not entirely sure if it's the same, but it looks like it's the same. So if you have a proof for grandfather off, uh, we'll take it as a, as a, a plausible answer for this query uh, of, of grandpa off. Now the way this works, or the way this is used in, in practice is, is not so much um, to, to do this kind of reasoning, um, but, but we, we go one step further, right? So, so we, we write down rules, but the rules are really just templates. Um, so so uh, the templates that, that specify the kinds of dependencies we want to learn. And so, so these are sort of latent predicates that they are predicates we want to learn. Uh, and uh, using training data, um, what is happening is that a vector representation for these latent predicates is learned. A vector representation for the actual predicates in your data set is being learned. And by doing that, uh, the model basically discovers rules. And, and they could be exact rules, they could be sort of um, yeah, more, um, yeah, um, um, common, common sense type rules. And on these data sets, um, and, and this is the example they give in the paper, 
uh, what happens if, if you train the model like that is that the model basically rediscovers the basic sort of transitivity rules that, that you need for, for, for solving these benchmarks. Uh, so that's one way to combine sort of neural network learning uh, with, with symbolic rules because you have I mean, structurally something that looks like a rule, but the predicates and the individuals correspond to vectors and, and they are being learned using sort of a, a backpropagation uh, mechanism. And this is another example. So, so uh, lifted relational neural networks. Uh, so here, the idea is not to use vectors, uh, but to represent, uh, it's based on fuzzy logic, essentially. So, so uh, logical connectives are replaced by um, uh, connectives from fuzzy logic, especially connectives that are continuous and differentiable, because that, that makes learning a lot easier. And each of these rules that you can see here is, uh, has a weight. So what that means is that if you know that O of X, O of X means here that if you know that X is an oxygen atom, then, then we infer that X belongs to group one with this particular weight. Now, what we do here is for all of the atoms that, that we have, uh, that we care about in our data set, we have a rule that that atom belongs to group one. And then we have another rule that says that each of these atoms belong to group two. And the idea is that um, the actual membership to the group is not defined by the rules. The membership is defined by the weights. And these weights are learned using backpropagation. So it's sort of a, a neural network learning approach uh, for learning these rules. And what, what is happening, what the neural network is doing in this way is it's learning these latent predicates, group one and group two. It's learning um, to yeah, soft clusters of, of atoms based on the fact that we want these, these groups to have the following property, that if X belongs to group one and Y belongs to group two, and there's a bound uh, between uh, atoms X and Y, then the molecule uh, in which these atoms occur is toxic. And so the idea is that, that we have examples of molecules and labels toxic or not. And, and, and we just train on, on, on the data that we have. And somehow this model learns that that's hidden latent structure that allows us to, to um, to make these predictions. So the idea is that um, we, we use rules to um, describe the, the, the sort of latent structures that, that we want the, the neural network to learn that would then allow us to, 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 to predict whatever it is that we want to predict. Uh, here's another example of, of uh, sort of combining logic programming uh, with, with uh, neural networks. So this is dproplog. Uh, proplog is a probabilistic logic programming language. And dproplog uh, so in, in Proplog, uh, so you have a bunch of rules, and then you have facts, but the facts are annotated with the probability. Um, in deep Proplog, that probability, rather than being explicitly given, the probability is the prediction of a neural network. So the neural networks are used to predict probabilities, and then these probabilities and the rules are combined in the using the traditional semantics of probabilistic logic programming. Um, and this is, for example, used to, um, yeah, so, so here is a toy example from the paper, where they learn addition of digits, but the digits are given as pictures. Uh, so you have the neural network that tells you uh, for a given picture, what is the probability that it uh, represents digit zero? What is the probability that it represents digit one? And then you have a rule that says, well, if the first digit is zero and the second digit is one, well, then their sum is one and, and, and so on. Uh, so, so we combine neural networks with, with, uh, with, with this uh, uh, probabilistic logic program and uh, again, the whole thing is, is trained uh, using backpropagation, which is uh, sort of what, what makes it work. Um, yeah, to, uh, what, what, yeah, what means that you can train the neural network in combination with, um, with, with, the, with the logic program. Um, and then maybe just very quickly um, to, to highlight that there are many other ways to combine neural networks with rules. A very common approach is to take a standard loss function for your neural network, so, so you train it on Maybe you, you want to train it on a classification task. So you have your standard loss function for your classification task. But then you have some rules or constraints that, that describe prior knowledge about maybe how different predictions are related to each other. And these rules are sort of encoded as an additional component in your loss function, often using fuzzy logic, uh, but sometimes using uh, different intuitions as well. So, so you, you just add a component to your loss function that sort of regular, regularizes your predictions based on prior knowledge that maybe two different items are very likely to, to belong to the same class, for example. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work on, on this. I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, and, and then as a last example, rules are often used for uh, data augmentation. 
right? So the idea here is that in traditional learning, we have examples that are labels, right? So we know that maybe X1, whatever X1 is, text documents, belongs to class Y1, uh, positive sentiments. Uh, and we have uh, training examples like this. So the setting that, that's considered in, uh, in particular in this paper is that the, the data does not only contain instances and, and, and class labels, but also rules that explain why that instance belongs to this class. So let's look at this example. So you have a text fragment. I highly recommend this modest priced cellular phone, which the annotator has labeled as uh, positive sentiments. And then the explanation is that, well, because it contains the phrase highly recommends, we can conclude that the class has to be positive. Now, the significance of this rule here is that uh, it allows us to create a lot more training data. We just take a, a bunch of documents that mention highly recommends, and we assume that um, all these documents belong to the positive class, right? So, so the idea is that we use rules to generalize from the specific label examples that we have, uh, and that allows us to get a, a lot more um, examples. The problem is that uh, these rules are noisy. I mean, it's not easy to, it's not difficult to see that some documents that contain the phrase highly recommend may not actually express um, uh, positive sentiments. Um, so visually, we can look at it like this. What you see here, the, the red crosses are the labeled examples that we know are, are uh, you know, negative uh, sentiment, for example. The blue circles are labeled examples that we know correspond to text fragments that represent positive sentiments. And then we have a rule for, for, for this particular example, X1, which basically tells us that everything in this red circle has positive sentiments. And then we have another rule that says that everything in this uh, whoops, uh, circle represent negative sentiments. And because these rules are heuristic, they overgeneralize. And what we can see here is in particular, these two rules are not compatible. So what the, the learning task now is that um, we, we simultaneously learn two different types of neural networks. One neural network that is trying to solve the task and one neural network that is trying to uh, learn how to restrict the scope of these rules. To, 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 so rather than apply these rules universally, they learn a restriction under which the rules are safe to apply. And, and so you have this joint learning of the data augmentation strategy and the actual uh, task that you're trying to solve. So just you know, to give you another example of how rules and neural networks are uh, being combined. Um, so that um, finishes um, th th this part of, of the talk. And now I will hand back over uh, to uh, Victor, who will uh, talk about rules as uh, spatial relations. Okay, I should unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as we were saying now, we are we are going to look at rules as special relations, and the the main motivation for doing so is that we would like to understand a little bit uh, the expressiveness of uh, certain embedding models and what we could do or how could we design um, a, a model or some. Uh, model that is based on, on, on this region view such that it captures a certain family of, um, of rules. So uh, as I was saying, what we are interested in is in uh, answering what does it mean for a neural model to capture generic knowledge and what is how this uh, generic knowledge uh, looks like, right? So which kind of uh, knowledge it's really capturing and it's able to, to then learn from uh, from this kind of regularities present in uh, in this kind of rules. For doing so, uh, then as I was saying, we will take a region view approach to have an understanding of uh, the type of knowledge that uh, certain embedding models can capture. And uh, to that aim, then we will borrow the notion of uh, conceptual spaces, which are uh, metric spaces uh, that are have been designed for uh, capturing properties and concepts, and these are such that uh, each dimension is a cognitive feature, 
So if you look at the at the slide that you have here, so one dimension is really talking about uh, the cognitive feature of dangerous and how dangerous something is if you move uh, further from 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 the origin, or how large something is if you move also further from 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 the origin. Uh, in this case, uh, conceptual spacers are such that uh, entities are embedded or are represented as, as points in this uh, highly dimensional metric space and concepts or properties are represented using uh, convex regions, right? So this region likes the one that I have here, mammal or vertebrate. Another remarkable thing about uh, conceptual spaces is that semantic relationships they correspond to relations on the in the spatial relations on the conceptual space for example uh, we will have that the relationship is our um, will correspond to the spatial relations relationship uh, part of as an example we could look at uh, all large spiders are scary and indeed, this corresponds to, to, the, to the relation part of, if we see, uh, no, the, the one above, all mammals are vertebrates. Uh, if we look at, uh, at, the, at the representation of the conceptual space, the region mammal that I have here is contained in the region uh, vertebrate. And we can also represent some other kind of knowledge. For example, we have that some vertebrates are scary so we have uh, here the, the, the vertebrate, and we have that in particular, uh, rattlesnake is scary, and we have that all large spiders are scary. So as, as I was saying, the the different uh, dimension, the different uh, dimensions of the of the of the conceptual space, they describe a cognitive feature. So I'm moving further here in this direction. So the spiders get larger. And as we see, cardinal spider is a large uh, spider, which is uh, a scary one. So then we would like to take this uh, region view to, to analyze the type of knowledge that embedding models can capture. Uh, a region-based view of two of the embedding models that we have already studied is, is, is the following. So we will look at... Um, at the following region that I have here, for example, for trans E, which is describing uh, the relation R. Uh, and it's such that we will have that uh, the concatenation of two uh, vectors, in this case, A and B, they occur here in the, in the region, uh, if and only if the triple that I'm talking about uh, is valid. Ah, is there a question in the chat? Can we consider uh, these regions as uh, sets? Well, yeah, that, that's a little one way of seeing it, right? So you, you can see that they are enclosing in a way uh, the different elements that you have. But please note that this, in, in this case, the, the example that I'm putting is, or that I am displaying, it's a two-dimensional example, right? Of course, these are, uh, this is just for illustrative uh, reasons, but conceptual spaces are also high, high dimensional uh, spaces. So it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, in two dimensions and then it becomes really unclear whether they are, they really correspond to, to sets. Um, yeah, and, and as I was saying, then uh, you have the composition of, uh, of both A and B and you have uh, the elements that occur here they are uh, the elements um, for which the the the, the relation are the triple R A R B is is valid, right? And this is thanks to the we can do this thanks to the fact that we have a hard threshold. Uh, this corresponds with what the, the view that we had before, and this model, as we saw, it it's defined so a hyperplane, and where you have the positive and the negative uh, apart, and the trip, the points that occur in this part are those that belong to the, uh, that are connected by, a, by R. Uh, taking this view on uh, modeling, um, uh, using uh, regions to, to, to model knowledge, we can have, for example, in a one-dimensional space, 
that uh, we will have that entities will be just simply points, for example, here, occurring here. And in this case, uh, generic predicates, they will be um, intervals, right? So in this case, we have that uh, the, the, the a unary concept for a unary predicate uh, plant is this interval and all the elements that belong to plant occur in here. Then what we could do, the thing that we could do to, to model rules, for example, is uh, that, as I was saying, we take the, the, the composition of the two, the two vectors, and then we will have that the relation X, for example, it's going to be a convex polytope. So this doesn't occur now in, in one dimension, but it's a two dimensional object. And as I was saying, we will have that uh, all the elements that occur within the, this region, for example, uh, lion zebra, we will have that is describing that lion is uh, a zebra. Right. Uh, coming back again to that notion that we borrow from uh, conceptual spaces, we can now use uh, spatial relations to describe the kind of rules or the kind of relationships that we have between different predicates. Let's look at, at an example. We could have, for example, that a carnivore X and exist X, Y implies animal Y. Why is this the case? because uh, we have that, for example, for carnivore uh, X, let's take an arbitrary one, lion, there exists uh, an animal uh, something that is eaten by, by a lion, which is a zebra, and that happens to be an animal. So in this way, we can once again, look at these uh, rules as uh, a spatial, uh, in, in terms of spatial relations. Which other kind of rule can we model with? For example, we could also have the following carnivore X implies X is Y and it's X, Y and animal Y, right? So indeed we have that uh, for each of these um, animals that are carnivore, there exists uh, another object, which is an animal and which is eaten by a lion. So. It's, it becomes just quite transparent how to model rules in terms of, uh, of regions. Uh, formally, how we describe these uh, logical theories as uh, special constraints uh, for relational facts, we do as, as, as follows. As I was saying, we take the, the concatenation of, um, of the different objects. So for a relational fact, R A1 to A N, we will have that it holds, it would hold if and only if the concatenation of the vectors A1 to AN belong to, to the region described by, uh, the, by this theta R, right? And the region representation in this case is an object in R n times k. Of course, in the example before, I was assuming that uh, that it was somehow some some one-dimensional uh, embedding in the sense that these uh, objects they 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 corresponded to points, but of course it could be a higher dimensional space, for example, in K, right? So in this case, we will not represent objects just as a one point, but as a vector with a K of size K. And finally, then we, 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 we could see that we can uh, represent rules. For example, the rule Rx and Sxy implies dy. We would say that it holds if it is the case that uh, the region R times Rn, uh, well, here should be times Rk, which is the, the, the size of or, or the the dimensionality of the interpretation intersected with the region S is contained in the uh, R times K times uh, the, the, the region uh, representing T. So intuitively what this means, so we have here this times Rn. So in this case, we are seeing uh, R as a binary relation 
where the second argument is trivial, right? So of course we had here that R was a unary uh, predicate, but what we are doing in order to be able to intersect the two different regions, one that is uh, representing a binary predicate, one that is representing a unary predicate is just that we look at the second component of the region R seen as a, as a binary relation as, so, as something that is just trivial. So once that we have defined a way of uh, looking at rules as special constraints, the, the, the question that we wanted to answer in this paper was uh, which kind of knowledge the uh, known knowledge graph embeddings are, are able to capture, which kind of rules, right? So we, we have already seen that some of these models are not capable to, to, to capture certain uh, inference patterns. For example, trans E is not able to capture symmetry. Uh, complex E, which is a bilinear model, is able to capture any configuration of the knowledge graph. But then regarding rules, the question is whether they can capture any type of rules or which kind of rules are they able to capture. So we consider any bilinear model that this means uh, the bilinear product of the embeddings of the, uh, of the entities and the relations. Consider, for example, complex E, which we, we saw was a bilinear model. And suppose that we want to, to, to model the following rules, right? The following hierarchy of relations. So we have that R1, XY implies S, XY up to RK, XY implies S, XY. So as I was saying, we have the following hierarchy. And the problem with the, the with this bilinear model is that we impose some uh, restrictions that are just not natural in the sense that uh, then there exists a permutation of the predicates. So these permutations such that, uh, for example, the permutation that I have here in red, R uh, tau i x y implies R tau i plus one x y. So, in this sense, what I'm forcing, or what the the embedding is forcing, is that suddenly, I did it in the, in my rules. It was not stated that the R i's were uh, in a relation in a hierarchical relation, but now the embedding is really forcing me to have them in this hierarchical relation, which is completely unnatural, right? There is no reason why they should be uh, in this hierarchical relation. The, the consequence of this result is that uh, bilinear models, they cannot capture uh, arbitrary rules because they are imposing constraints that are not uh, included in the, in, the, in the rule base. So the, the, the next question that we wanted to answer is can knowledge graph embeddings uh, or how can we define a knowledge graph embedding that could model arbitrary rules? And we show that uh, if we consider a model in which relations can be modeled as arbitrary convex polytopes, just in the spirit of uh, conceptual spaces, then all rules of the following form, which we will call quasi change can be modeled. So we will have that uh, B1 of uh, um, BI and BN implies X1, XJ, H1, H, HK. And in this case, we will call this quasi chain if it's the case that uh, there is a first order atom which shares at most one variable with, so one first order atom BI which shares at most one variable with BI up to BI minus one. So these quasi chain rules, they still are uh, reasonably important. For example, you can still express reachability using this language. Uh, and of course, this is a language that covers, covers much more, or quasi change rules cover much more than what uh, it's possible to, to model in, for example, using bilinear models. So in this sense, what we were trying to do here in, in this work is uh, finding a way of uh, modeling, uh, modeling rules. So, so in find, finding a model which can capture important rules. And the other second important part of, of, of these uh, results is that we show that existing, existing models, they cannot capture uh, even reasonable 
easy, simple uh, rules, for example, like uh, relation hierarchies. Uh, as I was saying then, in this case, uh, logic becomes important because it allows you to, to, to look at the expressiveness of the different uh, embedding models, uh, how they are compatible, so how the embedding vector space embeddings are compa compatible with the notion of capturing ontologies. Um, yeah, so I will try to be brief um, and finish this, this last part since we are short on time. Uh, we are back on using somehow looking more at, at, at the symbolic part, in which sense, in the sense that uh, we don't want to use uh, neural representations or we don't want to use logic to improve the, 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 the performance of, of neural, neural models, but it's the other way around, right? So we want to use the information that one can, then one could get from neural representations to allow for more flexible reasoning. So the question is how to make uh, reasoning in uh, symbolic systems not to rear or to brittle. And what is the motivation behind this? Uh, well, it's the need of interpretability uh, by means that uh, there is, this means that sometimes there is no alternative than using rule-based methods. As we were saying before, the, a little bit the problem of uh, rule-based methods is that they are not capable to learn something that is outside or patterns that are outside of the training data. So they can only cover situations that are in there. On the other hand, neural networks, they are able to, to interpolate uh, across these different situations. So they have this kind of inductive generalization capabilities that rule-based methods they don't have. So the question is, can we add these inductive generalization capabilities to rule-based methods uh, to uh, interpolate between previously seen situations? So how we use the information obtained from uh, neural networks to do so? So we are interested in uh, inductive reasoning. So imagine we have uh, the following situation. We have that tomatoes contain uh, vitamin B6, uh, mushrooms contain vitamin B6. Then we could induce that carrots contain uh, vitamin B6. This seems like a reasonable induction to do. Why? Because uh, in a sense, tomatoes and mushrooms, they are vegetables, which don't have too much in common. And uh, therefore, uh, therefore uh, it would be, it, it is reasonable to say that carrots also have uh, vitamin B6. Why? Because they, they, they don't share too many features besides, or too many properties besides the fact of being vegetables. The three of them are vegetables. So it's, it's, it's reasonable to, to conclude then that carrots also contain vitamin B6. Because the only knowledge that we have is that they are uh, vegetables. Uh, how about if we have the following? We have that kale contains vitamin B6, uh, that the spinach contains vitamin B6. Uh, could we, there, is there a good reason to induce that carrots contain also vitamin B6? Um, in this case, it's kind of unclear, right? Because kale and spinach, they are in a sense, very similar uh, vegetables because they, they are both uh, green leaves and they have many, many properties in common. So there is no reason to, to believe that uh, then carrots will also contain vitamin B, B6 because this is something that could be specific to this kind of vegetables only. So yeah, we, there are no reason, good reasons to induce uh, further this to, to, to carrots. How about using taxonomies? Can we use uh, taxonomies to somehow decide whether should we do the, uh, the induction or not? Well, not really right. The problem is that taxonomies are just to, to course in the sense that they don't really talk about the features and the properties of the different concepts. So we only know that, for example, uh, an edible mushroom is a vegetable, that the spinach is a vegetable, and that kale is a vegetable. We know that carrot is a root vegetable, which happens to be a vegetable, but it doesn't talk too much about which kind of properties they, they share, which kind of cognitive features they share, whether they are really uh, close in the sense that uh, they, they, 
they are defined by the same uh, main properties or they are simply two vegetables that are far apart because uh, they don't they don't they don't share really too much things in common so coming back then to 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 the idea of using um vector representations uh we cannot really do this as, as as i was saying at the pure symbolic level but we can again rely on the fact of embedding these concepts in some vector space and the basic idea is that this this uh embeddings or these uh, geometric representations what they normally tell us is uh how far apart they are depending on the properties that they share in this case, for example, we will have that uh, tomatoes and mushrooms, we know that both of them are vegetables, we know that both contain vitamin C, but they, they are in a sense far apart because they don't have too many properties besides being vegetables. What this means uh, in exchange is that all uh, concepts that I have in the middle between uh, tomatoes and, and mushroom must probably have the same properties, right? Because uh, the, the main, the, the basic feature properties that these, these have, then these elements that I have in the middle between mushrooms and tomatoes, they, they should also share. So intuitively what this is telling me is that uh, carrots are conceptually between mushrooms and tomatoes. And therefore they should share the most uh, natural basic features of both uh, tomatoes and mushrooms. So this, uh, Indeed, this, this notion of betweenness allows me then to decide whether I should be able to do induction or not, in the sense that uh, whether I can decide whether carrots contain vitamins, vitamin C or, or not. So the question is uh, then how do I obtain this notion of betweenness, right? So once again, I have this at the geometric level, but is there a way that I can now have this at the uh, symbolic level in such a way that I allow for flexibility in the reasoning at the symbolic level. Uh, and yes, the, the answer is yes. So there are there have been met the there have been methods that have been developed uh, in such a way that from textual representations you can uh, infer textual representations that are embedded, and then you can. Uh, extract from geometric between us conceptual between us right for example uh you could uh learn things like abbey is between or conceptually between castle and chapel uh you have that bistro is conceptually between restaurant and tea room so uh this is good news because then now you have we have potentially uh, this symbolic information available to decide whether two things are conceptually between uh, or two concepts are, a concept is be conceptually between two other ones and then implement uh, flexible reasoning. Uh, using this kind of ideas, uh, recently, for example, a method was developed using graph convolutional networks in which uh, you can do interpolation in a sense, right? Uh, so how this works is that you have uh, for example, what we want is the following. You have a red table wine, implies table one, dry one, dry white wine implies table one, burnburi implies table one. So, and then you want to induce that dry red wine then implies table one. The, the first three rules are given in the knowledge base and the other one is the one that you, the, that you are learning. Uh, how do, Intuitively, how this is done is by introducing uh, second order predicates, which are template rules in which the yellow part, this is a placeholder. So you could imagine that you don't have red table one, but you just have this yellow, yellow, yellow implies uh, table one. And then you want to, to, to learn from the structure of these templates, whether uh, there is some other predicate that implies stable wine. Intuitively, what this is telling me is that dry, dry red wine is uh, conceptually between or is sharing the same properties as red table wine, dry white, white wine, or bonberry uh, wine. Uh, the basic idea is then to, to have this graph neural network where you annotate each uh, node with, with a vector, which contains prior knowledge about the predicates. And then the H's contain uh, 
information about the templates, right? Which kind of predicates are, are participating in, in which uh, templates. Just in a similar idea, but now the templates are not unary as in the case that we have here. So here the placeholder was just this one. So the, 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 yeah, the placeholder that we have, but now we have binary templates where we have two placeholders. We have this one uh, and this one. So in this case, we can not only learn uh, using interpo interpolation, but we can also uh, learn using analogies. Uh, indeed, the system, the, this uh, approach is uh, capable of doing the following. So given in your knowledge base, uh, mean, men's team X implies exists to a Y such that has member X, Y and man Y and mixed team X implies X, Y has member X, Y and woman Y. So it can do an analogy in the sense that it will infer or we learned a new rule saying that woman's team X implies X is Y has member X, Y and woman Y. So, and the analogy is because uh, it's, this rule is analogical to this one in the sense that uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the same uh, template, but uh, applied to, to, to women instead of, of men. One of the, of the things is that uh, this uh, previous work is uh, mainly heuristic as, as you have seen, then there you have, uh, you use graph neural networks to decide whether or to learn the, the, the new rules these new interpolation rules. But uh, recently we have been kind of more interested in developing a model theoretic semantics for inter interpolative reasoning in description logics. So once again, we want to take advantage of the fact that we can learn this uh, between us between two different concepts, this conceptual between us between two different concepts, and then incorpor incorporate this knowledge within the ontology and then define a semantics allowing to do interpolation. So what, what do I mean by this? Imagine that you have uh, in your ontology that are, every rabbit is a herbivore, that every giraffe is a herbivore, and that the zebra is uh, between rabbit and a giraffe, right? So what this means is that the zebra has exactly the, the same basic properties or the same natural properties as rabbit and giraffe, and doing interpolation, what I would like to conclude then is that a uh, zebra is also a uh, herbivore. In this work, we have followed two different paths for defining the semantics. So one is uh, using features. So this basic idea that uh, concepts have associated some cognitive, uh, co cognitive features. And this follows a little bit the lines of formal concept analysis. And uh, the other kind of semantics that we have designed, once again, borrows from the notion of conceptual spaces. So in this case, we, we have uh, geometric models, just as the one that, that we were discussing before. So in terms of uh, spatial reasoning. It's, it's not trivial exactly to know what is the, 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 the right semantics to do this kind of interpolation. So the, the path that we have, we have followed from the start is to start with a, a basic uh, description logic language like EL, in which we know that the, the semantics that we have works well for interpolation, but it's uh, some, somehow challenging to decide whether these semantics can be lifted to more complex uh, languages or what are the requirements to do so uh, yeah, in such a way that it makes sense. So it seems that the, at the end I had uh, enough time to, to, to finish this, uh, this part, which uh, was the remaining one. And this uh, uh, concludes the, the, the tutorial. And as you saw, there were we were touching many, many points uh, regarding the relationship between logic and neural networks. And the main, the main ingredient or the main thing that we wanted to tackle is how uh, neural representations have been used for uh, representing knowledge. But of course, uh, there are some cases or one of the main interests for this community would, is also how can we use the, the information that one has obtained from neural, net, neural networks to improve the reasoning or to define a more flexible reasoning 
within uh, existing uh, ontology or rule languages. Um, of course, there are many things open, even in, in the site of neural networks, uh, for example, like establishing or which might be challenging, establishing whether, uh, for example, language models are doing really reasoning or they are doing uh, just some guessing. Uh, uh, establishing, for example, the logical expressiveness of transformers. As far as I know, this has not been done. Some work has already been done in establishing the logical expressiveness of uh, graph neural networks or uh, empir empirically uh, design or decide which kind of reasoning uh, graph neural networks are able to do. But uh, yeah, there are many, many things open and mainly those related with, with common sense reasoning, which uh, seems to be much more challenging. Uh, are there any questions in the last two minutes that we have? Um, so, um, yeah, so, so we're trying to predict uh, the probability that the given triple is, is accurate. Um, and, and surprisingly, it, it works really well. So here's a comparison with a, a number of standard methods on uh, three uh, standard benchmarks. And you can see that, es especially in mean rank, so that, that's on average how far in, in, in the list of, of predictions is the, uh, is the correct uh, answer. No, that doesn't make any. You know, it, it works quite well. And the, why this is remarkable is because this is a model that was not designed for knowledge graph completion. We really. just have a, have a sort of linearization of the triple, so, so some kind of sentence encoding. You put a classifier on, or, or a regressor on, on top of the model, and that's it. You, you don't try to design anything to, to, to work um, well for knowledge graph completion. Um, right. Um, so um, there's also been work on, on, on question answering. So, so um, um, for example, using this model called uh, T5. So T5 is, is, a, is a, another variant of, of is, is a language model. It's trained slightly differently from, um, uh, from BERT, the, the, the model I explained before. Uh, so here in the pre-training, you take a sentence, you uh, mask a, a, a phrase. Uh, so not just a word, but, but a phrase. And the model is trained to predict here the missing phrase, right? Uh, so so it's it sort of uh, is a sort of input output model um, that, that predicts missing phrases, and it turns out that this sort of input output or encoder decoder uh, model it works very well uh, for question answering. So once that model has been pre-trained, what you do is you, you find units on question answer pairs. So when was Franklin D Roosevelt born? Nineteen eighty-two. Uh, so you, you train it, uh, and, and but by training it like this. Um, what you're doing is, is you're telling the model that you wanted to answer questions, right? Um, but then uh, it turns out that after you, you fine tune the model like this, you can actually use it to uh, also answer different questions. Questions that need specific factual knowledge that, that you haven't given it during training. So, so the point is that, again, even though there's no explicit supervision really going on, this model learns I mean, a, a lot of, of, of world knowledge. Um, but in this case, the focus is on, on factual world knowledge. Uh, and in fact, uh, so in, in this paper, they um, compared this, this T5 model uh, that, that works in the way that I explained with models that actually um, retrieve relevant um, passages. So, so, so the, the classical approach to question answering is you have the question, from the question, you, you find relevant documents on the web that are likely to contain the answer you extract these documents and then you, you feed these documents through uh, some kind of neural uh, network model that tries to extract the answers from the, the, the relevant documents that you just find. So that's known as open book question answering because your question and answering model doesn't need to have any knowledge. It just needs to learn how to identify the answer in a document that contains the answer. And um, whereas what the T5 model is doing is, is what is known as closed book question answering is that uh, it doesn't use any external knowledge at all. And it turns out that actually it, it does as well as um, you know, the, the, the best uh, open book model. So that means that all the knowledge that you need for, for answering questions in, in these particular benchmarks, essentially the model already has that knowledge after, uh, after that particular pre-training task. 
So again, evidence that, that these models capture a lot of, of, uh, a lot of knowledge. Um, all right, and then um, as the sort of the, the final uh, point of this part of the, um, of the tutorial, and then um, I think we'll have a, a break. Uh, I just want to give this example of, of GPT-3. Now GPT-3 is you know, yet another language model, uh, but what sets it apart is um, the fact that it's huge. It has 175 billion parameters. It's sort of really um, at, at the limits of, of what is possible with sort of brute force training of these language models. So it's, it's a huge, huge model, uh, but it's extremely impressive. And so here's an, an example. So this model is, is trained specifically to complete uh, sentences or, or paragraphs. So, so you give it the beginning of a sentence or a paragraph, and then it, it, it continues right. So it's different from BERT, where you predict masked words in the middle of a sentence. It, it, it sort of continues where, where you start off. Um, so this is the input given to the model, right? And again, this is not fine-tuned on any particular explicit training data. Just you train it on, 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 a, on a large text collection, and it does the following. So the input you give it is, is this. At the party, I poured myself a glass of lemonade but it turned out to be too so sour. So I added a little sugar. I didn't see a spoon handy, so I started with the cookie. But that turned out to be a bad idea because, okay? And, and then as this is the, the, the prompt, the input, and then you ask this language model to complete uh, your story. And uh, so this is what it comes up with. Because the cookie crumbled and made the lemonade cloudy. So I tried to fish out the crumbs with a fork, but I couldn't get them all. And I ended up drinking a lot of crumbs. So that's, I would say extremely re remarkable. It, it shows a, a rather solid understanding of a number of common sense uh, aspects to the story. That, you know, what, what happens if you put a cookie in lemonade? Uh, what, what can you do or, or not with, with a fork? Um, and, and so it, it, it's quite uh, remarkable. One of the most um, hyped aspects, I would say, of this model is that also it learns to do tasks um, by looking at the input. So previously with the, the older language models, if you wanted it to answer questions, you had to sort of train it on question answering pairs. But with GPT-3, you take the model as it is, and as part of the input, uh, you, you sort of tell the model what it is that you want to want it to do. So here is a Q and then a question, A and then the answer to the question. You have a, give a couple of examples like that, then you put Q, the question, and then you let the model continue, and the model picks up the fact that what you wanted to do is answer that question, even though it has not been trained for that purpose. Uh, so this is again remarkable. What's also remarkable is you know the the, the ability to to answer in a meaningful way. So in this particular question, what is your favorite animal? So this is all part of the input, right? So what is your favorite animal? Give it to three answers. Uh, my favorite animal is a dog. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, but then so this conversation continues. Uh, each of the, the 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 things in bold is you know. GPT-3 that continues, the things not in bold is sort of the, the, the person having the dialogue that types the question. And so why? Because dogs are loyal and friendly. Okay, so then we try to be, um, I say we, it, it, so, so then it wasn't, it wasn't me who did it. Uh, what are the two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood? Well, two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood are if it is hungry or if it is hot. How many eyes does a giraffe have? Two eyes, how many legs does a frog have? Four legs. Are there anim animals with three legs? No, there are no animals with three legs. Why don't animals have three legs? Animals don't have three legs because they would fall over. So pretty, pretty reasonable for a system that has not been trained at all to answer questions, let alone um, questions that involve common sense. Uh, the, the way to sort of trip it up is again to give very unusual inputs, right? So how many eyes does my foot have? Um, and then the models just start guessing. Oh, your foot has two eyes. Um, and then it just gets crazy. My favorite one is this. Uh, how many rainbows does it take to jump from Hawaii to 17? Apparently, it takes two rainbows. And um, so this is sort of the clear weakness of these language models. They kind of deal with unusual inputs. And uh, from the way they behave, you cannot really work out whether they know the answer and they give you something meaningful or whether they're just hallucinating and, and giving you something, uh, something random. So, so um, what I want to talk about now is, is yeah, reasoning and rules, right? Because um, I mean, the, the broader question really is, is sort of, yeah, what is the right way to, to learn uh, knowledge, knowledge, not just facts, but, but also generic knowledge, and, and uh, do, do, uh, when and in what context and for what reasons do we need symbolic uh, encodings of knowledge rather than sort of something that's hidden in a neural network. Um, now, the question of how well these language models can reason 
is difficult to answer, right? Because it, it depends on, on, on how exactly you, you set up the task. So I'll just give an overview of the number of works that have been done to, to analyze this question. So here's the typical sort of probing task that we saw before the break. Uh, so A is made out of glass and B is made out of stone. So A is blank uh, transparent. And, and we look at whether the probability of more is higher or the probability or less is higher. And, and if a model has learned to, to apply common sense reasoning, uh, you would expect that it, it can correctly answer these kinds of questions, right? Uh, and it turns out that it's not the case. It, it, basically, um, existing models are ran random guessing, uh, are doing random guessing. Um, now, the caveat here is that, again, these are very unusual things, right? That this is not something that we would typically write. And, and, and we know that the language models struggle with unusual uh, inputs. Um, so something else that people have done is actually train a language model, the transformer-based architecture from scratch, but rather than training it on Wikipedia, train it on a synthetic corpus of, of triples, sort of knowledge graph-like triples. And um, triples that have been generated in accordance with certain rules. So you know the rules, you, you come up with the rules, you generate the triples in accordance to the rules, and then you can verify to what extent your language model that you trained on that synthetic corpus is able to apply these rules, right? So what are these rules? Uh, simple things, uh, equivalence, right? So it's two relations meaning the same thing, R and S. Symmetry, uh, so uh, if you swap head and tail entity, is the triple still valid? Um, inversion, if you swap head and tail entity, is there another relation that you can put there that, that makes triple valid? Negation, okay. Um, implication, um, and uh, so as uh, just entailment, and, and composition, which is, I mean, one I guess we're mostly interested in is, is sort of rule knowledge, right? Is, is the, the model able to, to learn basic um, data log rules? Um, and so, so what they do is, is so they, 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 they have the, the initial triples, they apply the rules, so you have the closure, uh, but the inferred facts, they split into training and test training. They are added to the, the, the text collection that is used for training the language model. Test is, is, is used to check um, the, um, the, the, the generalization abilities of the model. So here are the results. Train is if we uh, check how, how uh, what the language model believes. If you look at facts that it had, has actually seen during training. And as you can see, these models can memorize pretty much everything they've seen in training. So no problems there. But the real question is, is these test examples, right? Can the models infer things uh, based on, on rules they have seen over and over again during training? And so the answer depends a lot on, on the type of rule we're talking about. Symmetry and equivalence, uh, basically they, they, they capture. Uh, but composition, which is sort of rules, you can see accuracy is pretty much zero. So, so that they are not able to learn uh, that kind of rule knowledge, at least not in this particular setting. Um, and there's also yeah, an interesting point in the paper that, yes, the results for symmetry are very good, but actually, for some reason, the language model BERT has a preference for things to be symmetric. So even if you start with anti-symmetric relations, BERT will actually think it's symmetric and it just makes everything symmetric. Uh, so, so it's performing well here, but, but that's you know because it somehow has this preference for things being symmetric. Um, so standard sort of um, reasoning. So here, the idea is that we train the model on, on text fragments like this. A uh, bunch of facts, a bunch of rules. So basic if-then rules. Uh, so basic mode of exponents reasoning, but, but chains. Um, and then you know, uh, we get the, the, the model to answer questions that require chaining sort of these rules, right? Um, and um, so, 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 so you, you, of course, these, these are synthetically generated text documents, so we can generate a lot. Uh, we can train the model and then we see whether it generalizes to, um, to, to cases it hasn't seen during training. Um, the, the, the points, the key points that is being analyzed here is whether um, the model generalizes in terms of the number of inference steps. So what you can see here is, um, for example, here, model two, was trained on examples that needed at most two inference steps in sort of the chaining the, the modus ponens uh, rules. Um, and what you can see is that it is successfully generalizing that reasoning behavior as long as the number of inference steps doesn't increase. But if you need more inference steps, it, it's sort of, it doesn't fail completely, but, but, but it, it starts to underperform significantly. So it is possible to sort of teach the model to apply modus ponens in these very synthetic settings. Um, but generalizing the number of inference steps is, is harder. Um, 
So something else that, again, moving away a little bit from synthetic examples uh, that has been observed is that these models struggle a lot uh, to combine things from different sentences. So here's, here's a benchmark where you have two sentences and you have to complete the second sentence. But to do it, to, to find the correct answer, you need the context that's provided by the first sentence. So here, Pablo wanted to cut the lumber he had bought to make some sh shelves. He asked his neighbor if he could borrow her. Um, and okay, so it's not, not very difficult to guess that we want something like saw. Uh, but what Bert is, uh, this language model is basically doing is it, it, it ignores the, the first sentence completely. And it just puts words that are plausible um, if you only look at, at the second sentence. So if he could borrow her car. Um, and and um, yeah, maybe I'll skip this. There's a number of other examples that there's many more in, in the paper, um, which basically all confirm the same idea that, that you know, this language model is, is completing the sentence in a plausible way, but it doesn't uh, learn to, to apply the, the context that's provided in the first sentence that actually matters for, for, for the, the, the kind of common sense reasoning uh, that we need here. Um, knowledge graph completion um, has also been studied. So, we looked at, at knowledge graph completion in the sense of directly scoring triples. Uh, what they do here is actually learning uh, whether um, a triple follows from a certain, uh, so, so you have a certain path in, in the knowledge graph that connects two entities, Franklin Roosevelt and Washington DC here. And so can we train BERT to, to recognize that um, th this path entails this triple? Uh, and this is used in particular for inductive knowledge graph completion. So that means that the entities that you want to apply this inference pattern to are different from the entities that, that the model has seen during training. Um, and um, the, the answer is that yes, the, the, the actually this works remarkably well. Um, so so one, one of the mo better known benchmarks is Grail and so for, for this inductive knowledge graph completion setting. So Grail uses graph neural networks to learn these inference patterns. Um, and um, yeah, somehow, you know, even though it, it's a type of reasoning that this language model um, seems to be quite successful. Of course, we don't know uh, whether it's how much its success depends on, on its ability to reason and how much its success really depends because it just has a lot of prior knowledge about these, um, these entities. Okay, so that um, sort of finishes the, the story about uh, language models. The story is not complete, right? There's no definitive answer, I would say, to, to, to the question how much knowledge these models are really capturing, how much rule knowledge, how much reasoning they're able to do. Um, but um, yeah, to, yeah, to be continued, let, 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 let's leave it there. So the next topic, um, we're going to look again at symbolic rules. And so um, look at what role symbolic rules or, or, or um, something that looks like a symbolic rule can, can play in combination with neural networks. And um, so the first example, I mean, Victor already, uh, briefly explained in the introduction um, is, is to do sort of soft unification, right? So here we have a, a logic program and, and we have a query, but, but the terminology of the query is slightly different from uh, the terminology in your logic program. Uh, so instead of grandfather of, we have grandpa of. So traditional prolog obviously fails. Um, so this is very much motivated from applications in natural language processing again, where um, you know, the predicates would correspond to words in natural language and uh, you may not have exact matches. Um, and the idea here is that, okay, traditional prologue fails, but what if we have a vector representation of the different predicates and the different um, individuals? And, and what if, if that vector representation tells us that grandfather of and grandpa of are very similar relations? Uh, so then um, essentially what, what we do is we have this sort of soft unification that tells us that, um, well, we're not entirely sure if it's the same, but it looks like it's the same. So if you have a proof for grandfather of, uh, we'll take it as a, as a, no, a plausible answer for this query uh, of, of grandpa of. Now the way this works, or the way this is used in, in practice is not so much um, to do to, to this kind of reasoning, um, but, but we, we go one step further, right? So, so we, we write down rules, but the rules are really just templates. Um, so so uh, the templates that, that specify the kinds of dependencies we want to learn. And so, so these are sort of latent predicates that they are predicates we want to learn. Uh, and uh, using training data, um, what is happening is that a vector representation for these latent predicates is learned. A vector representation for the actual predicates in your data set is being learned. 
And by doing that, uh, the model basically discovers rules. And, and they could be exact rules, they could be sort of um, yeah, more, um, yeah, um, um, common, common sense type rules. And on these data sets, um, and, and this is the example they give in the paper, uh, what happens if, if you train the model like that is that the model basically rediscovers the basic sort of transitivity rules that, that you need for, for, for solving these benchmarks. Uh, so that's one way to combine sort of neural network learning uh, with, with symbolic rules, because you have I mean, structurally something that looks like a rule, but the predicates and the individuals correspond to vectors and, and they are being learned using sort of a, a backpropagation uh, mechanism. Um, this is another example, so, so uh, lifted relational neural networks. Uh, so here the idea is not to use vectors, uh, but to represent, uh, it, it's based on fuzzy logic essentially. So, so uh, logical connectives are replaced by um, uh, connectives from fuzzy logic, especially connectives that are continuous and differentiable, because that, that makes learning a lot easier. And each of these rules that you can see here is, uh, has a weight. So what that means is that if you know that uh, O of X, O of X means here that if you know that X is an oxygen atom, then, then we infer that X belongs to group one with this particular weight. Now, what we do here is for all of the atoms that, that we have, uh, that we care about in our data set, we have a rule that that atom belongs to group one. And then we have another rule that says that each of these atoms belong to group two. And the idea is that um, the actual membership to the group is not defined by the rules. The membership is defined by the weights. And these weights are learned using backpropagation. So it's sort of a neural network learning approach uh, for learning these rules. And what is happening, what the neural network is doing in this way, is it's learning these latent predicates, group one and group two. It's learning um, to get yeah, soft clusters of, of atoms based on the fact that we want these, these groups to have the following property, that if X belongs to group one and Y belongs to group two, and there's a bound uh, between uh, atoms of X and Y, then the molecule uh, in which these atoms occur is toxic. And so the idea is that, that we have examples of molecules and labels toxic or not, and, and, and we just train on, on, on the data that we have. And somehow this model learns that that's hidden latent structure that allows us to, to um, to make these predictions. So the idea is that um, we, we use rules to um, describe the, the, the sort of latent structures that, that we want the, the neural network to learn that would then allow us to, 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 to predict whatever it is that we want to predict. Uh, here's another example of, of a sort of combining logic programming uh, with, with uh, neural networks. So this is dproplog. Uh, proplog is a probabilistic logic programming language. And dproplog uh, so in, in Proplog, uh, so you have a bunch of rules, and then you have facts, but the facts are annotated with the probability. And um, in deep Proplog, that probability, rather than being explicitly given, the probability is the prediction of a neural network. So the neural networks are used to predict probabilities, and then these probabilities and the rules are combined in the using the traditional semantics of probabilistic logic programming. Um, and this is, for example, used to, um, yeah, so, so here's he a, a toy example from the paper, where they learn addition of digits, but the digits are given as pictures. Uh, so you have the neural network that tells you uh, for a given picture, what is the probability that it uh, represents digit zero? What is the probability that it represents digit one? And then you have a rule that says, well, if the first digit is zero and the second digit is one, well, then their sum is one and, and, and so on. Uh, so, so we combine neural networks with, with, uh, with, with this uh, uh, probabilistic logic program and uh, again, the whole thing is, is trained uh, using backpropagation, which is uh, sort of what, what makes it work. Um, yeah, to, uh, what, yeah, what means that you can train the neural network in combination with, um, with, with the logic program. Um, and then maybe just very quickly um, to, to highlight that there are many other ways to combine neural networks with rules. A very common approach is to take a standard loss function for your neural network, so, so you train it on Maybe you, you want to train it on a classification task. So you have your standard loss function for your classification task. But then you have some rules or constraints that, that describe prior knowledge about maybe how different predictions are related to each other. And these rules are sort of encoded as an additional component in your loss function, often using fuzzy logic, uh, but sometimes using uh, different intuitions as well. So, so you, you just add a component to your loss function that sort of regular, regularizes your predictions based on prior knowledge that maybe 
two different items are very likely to, to belong to the same class, for example. And so there's a lot of work on, on this. I'm not going to go into detail here. And, and, and then as a last example, rules are often used for uh, data augmentation, right? So the idea here is that in traditional learning, we have examples that are labeled, right? So we know that maybe X1, whatever X1 is, text documents, belongs to class Y1, uh, positive sentiments. Uh, and we have uh, training examples like this. Now the setting that, that's considered in, in, uh, in this paper is that the, the data does not only contain instances and, and, and class labels, but also rules that explain why that instance belongs to this class. So let's look at this example. So you have a text fragment. I highly recommend this modest priced cellular phone, which the annotator has labeled as uh, positive sentiments. And then the explanation is that, well, because it contains the phrase highly recommends, we can conclude that the class has to be positive. Now, the significance of this rule here is that uh, it allows us to create a lot more training data. We just take a bunch of documents that mention highly recommends, and we assume that um, all these documents belong to the positive class. Right? So, so the idea is that we use rules to generalize from the specific labeled examples that we have, uh, and that allows us to get a, a lot more um, examples. The problem is that uh, these rules are noisy. I mean, it's not easy to, it's not difficult to see that some documents that contain the phrase highly recommend may not actually express um, uh, positive sentiments. Um, so visually, we can look at it like this. What you see here, the, the red crosses are the labeled examples that we know are, are uh, you know, negative uh, sentiment, for example. The blue circles are labeled examples that we know correspond to text fragments that represent positive sentiments. And then we have a rule for, for, for this particular example, X1, which basically tells us that everything in this red circle has positive sentiment. And then we have another rule that says that everything in this uh, whoops, uh, circle represent negative sentiments. And because these rules are heuristic, they overgeneralize. And what we can see here is in particular, that these two rules are not compatible. So what the, the learning task now is that um, we, we simultaneously learn two different types of neural networks. One neural network that is trying to solve the task and one neural network that is trying to uh, learn how to restrict the scope of these rules. To, 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 so rather than apply these rules universally, they learn a restriction under which the rules are safe to apply. And, and so you have this joint learning of the data augmentation strategy and the actual uh, task that you're trying to solve. So just you know, to give you another example of how rules and neural networks are uh, being combined. Um, so that um, finishes um, th th this part of, of the talk. And now I will hand back over um, to uh, Victor, who will uh, talk about rules as uh, spatial relations. Okay, I should unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as we were saying now, we are we are going to look at rules as special relations and the, the main motivation for doing so is that we would like to understand a little bit uh, the expressiveness of uh, certain embedding models and what we could do or how could we design um, a, a model or some, uh, model that is based on, on, on this region view such that it captures a certain family of, um, of rules. So uh, as I was saying, what we are interested in is in uh, answering what does it mean for a neural model to capture generic knowledge and what is how this uh, generic knowledge uh, looks like, right? So which kind of uh, knowledge it's really capturing and it's able to, to then learn from uh, from this kind of regularities present in uh, in this kind of rules. For doing so, uh, then as I was saying, we will take a region view approach to have an understanding of uh, the type of knowledge that uh, certain embedding models can capture. Uh, to that aim, 
then we will borrow the notion of uh, conceptual spaces, which are uh, metric spaces uh, that are have been designed for uh, capturing properties and concepts. And these are such that uh, each dimension is a cognitive feature. So if you look at the, at the slide that we have here, so one dimension is really talking about uh, the cognitive feature of dangerous and how dangerous something is if you move uh, further from, from, from the origin or how large something is if you move also further from, from, from the origin. Uh, in this case, uh, conceptual spacers are such that uh, entities are embedded or are represented as, as points in this uh, highly dimensional metric space and concepts or properties are represented using uh, convex regions, right? So this region like the one that I have here, mammal or vertebrate. Another remarkable thing about uh, conceptual spaces is that semantic relationships, they correspond to relations on the, in the special relations on the conceptual space. For example, uh, we will have that the relationship is our um, will correspond to the special relations, relationship uh, part of. As an example, we could look at uh, all large spiders are scary and indeed, this corresponds to to the to the relation part of. If we see, uh, no, the the one above, all mammals are vertebrates. Uh, if we look at uh, at the at the representation of the conceptual space, the region mammal that I have here is contained in the region uh, vertebrate. And we can also represent some other kind of knowledge. For example, we have that some vertebrates are scary. So we have uh, here the, the, the vertebrate, and we have that in particular, uh, rattlesnake is scary, and we have that all large spiders are scary. So as, as I was saying, the the different uh, dimension, the different uh, dimensions of the of the of the conceptual space, they describe a cognitive feature. So I'm moving further here in this direction. So the spiders get larger, and as we see, cardinal spider is a large uh, spider, which is uh, a scary one. So then we would like to take this uh, region view to, to analyze the type of knowledge that embedding models can capture. Uh, a region-based view of two of the embedding models that we have already studied is, is, is the following. So we will look at... Um, at the following region that I have here, for example, for trans E, which is describing uh, the relation R. Uh, and it's such that we will have that uh, the concatenation of two uh, vectors, in this case, A and B, they occur here in the, in the region, uh, if and only if the triple that I'm talking about uh, is valid. Ah, is there a question in the chat? Can we consider uh, these regions as sets? Well, yeah, that, that's a little one way of seeing it, right? So you, you can see that they are enclosing in a way uh, the different elements that you have. But please note that this, in, in this case, the, the example that I'm putting is or that I am displaying. It's a two-dimensional example, right? Of course, these are, uh, this is just for illustrative uh, reasons, but conceptual spaces are also high, high dimensional uh, spaces. So it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, in two dimensions and then it becomes really unclear whether they are, they really correspond to, to sets. Um, yeah, and, and as I was saying, then uh, you have the composition of, uh, of both A and B and you have uh, the elements that occur here they are uh, the elements um, for which the the the, the relation R, the triple A, A, R, B is is valid, right? And this is thanks to the we can do this thanks to the fact that we have a hard threshold. Uh, this corresponds with what the, the view that we had before, and this model, as we saw, it 
it's defined so a hyperplane and where you have the positive and the negative uh, apart and the trip, the points that occur in this part are those that belong to the uh, that are connected by a, by r uh, taking this view on uh, modeling um uh, using uh, regions to, to, to model knowledge, we can have, for example, in a one-dimensional space that uh, we will have that entities will be just simply points, for example, here, occurring okay, here. And in this case, uh, generally predicates, they will be um, intervals, right? So in this case, we have that uh, the, the, the a unary concept or a unary predicate uh, plant is this interval and all the elements that belong to plant occur in here. Then what we could do, the thing that we could do to, to model rules, for example, is uh, that as I was saying, we take the, the, the composition of the two, the two vectors, and then we will have that the relation it's, for example, it's going to be a convex polytope. So this doesn't occur now in, in one dimension, but it's a two-dimensional object. And as I was saying, we will have that uh, all the elements that occur within the this region, for example, uh, lion zebra, we will have that is describing that lion, it's uh, a zebra, right? Uh, coming back again to that notion that we borrow from uh, conceptual spaces, we can now use uh, spatial relations to describe the kind of rules or the kind of relationships that we have between different predicates. Let's look at, at an example. We could have, for example, that a carnivore X and exist X, Y implies animal Y. Why is this the case? Because uh, we have that, for example, for carnivore uh, X, let's take an arbitrary one lion, there exists uh, an animal uh, something that is eaten by, by a lion, which is a zebra, and that happens to be an animal. So in this way, we can once again look at these uh, rules as uh, a spatial, uh, in, in terms of spatial relations. Which other kind of rule can we model? Well, for example, we could also have the following carnivore X implies X is Y, and it's X, Y, and animal Y, right? So indeed we have that uh, for each of these um, animals that are carnivore, there exists uh, another object, which is an animal and which is eaten by a lion. So it's, it becomes just quite transparent how to model rules in terms of, uh, of regions. Uh, Formally, how we describe these uh, logical theories as uh, special constraints uh, for relational facts, we do as, as, as follows. As I was saying, we take the, the concatenation of, um, of the different objects. So for a relational fact R A1 to AN, we will have that it holds, it would hold if and only if the concatenation of the vectors A1 to AN belong to, to the region described by, uh, the, by this theta r, right? And the region representation in this case is an object in r n times k. Of course, in the example before, I was assuming that, uh, that it was somehow some, some one dimensional uh, embedding in the sense that these uh, objects, they, they, they corresponded to points, but of course it could be a higher dimensional space, for example, in K, right? So in this case, we will not represent objects just as a one point, but as a vector with uh, K of size K. And finally, then we, 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 we could see that we can uh, represent uh, rules for example, the rule Rx and Sxy implies dy, we would say that it holds if it is the case that uh, the region R times Rn, uh, well, here should be times Rk, which is the, the, the size of or, or the, 
the dimensionality of the interpretation intersected with the region S is contained in the uh, R times K times uh, the, the, the region uh, representing T. So intuitively what this means, so we have here these times Rn. So in this case, we are seeing uh, R as a binary relation where the second argument is trivial, right? So of course we had here that R was a unary uh, predicate, but what we are doing in order to be able to intersect the two different regions, one that is uh, representing a binary predicate, the one that is representing a unary predicate is just that we look at the second component of the region R seen as a, as a binary relation as, so, as something that is just trivial. So once that we have defined a way of uh, looking at rules as special constraints, the, the, the question that we wanted to answer in this paper was uh, which kind of knowledge the uh, known knowledge graph embeddings are, are able to capture, which kind of rules, right? So we, we have already seen that some of these models are not capable to, to, to capture certain uh, inference patterns. For example, trans E is not able to capture symmetry. Uh, complex E, which is a bilinear model, is able to capture any configuration of the knowledge graph. But then regarding rules, the question is whether they can capture any type of rules or which kind of rules are they able to capture. So we consider any bilinear model that this means uh, the bilinear product of the embeddings of the, uh, of the entities and the relations. Consider for example, complex E, which we, we saw was a bilinear model. And suppose that we want to, to, to model the following rules, right? The following hierarchy of relations. So we have that R1 XY implies S XY up to RK XY implies S XY. So as I was saying, we have the following hierarchy. And the problem with the, the with this bilinear model is that we impose some uh, restrictions that are just not natural in the sense that uh, then there exists a permutation of the predicates. So these permutations such that, uh, for example, the permutation that I have here in red, R uh, tau i x y implies R tau i plus one x y. So in this sense, what I'm forcing or what the, the embedding is forcing is that suddenly I did it in, the, in my roots, it was not stated that the RIs were uh, in a relation, in a hierarchical relation, but now the embedding is really forcing me to have them in this hierarchical relation, which is completely unnatural, right? There is no reason why they should be uh, in this hierarchical relation. The, the consequence of this result is that uh, bilinear models, they cannot capture uh, arbitrary rules because they are imposing constraints that are not uh, included in the, in, the, in the rule base. So the, the, the next question that we wanted to answer is can knowledge graph embeddings uh, or how can we define a knowledge graph embedding that could model arbitrary rules? And we show that uh, if we consider a model in which relations can be modeled as arbitrary convex polytopes, just in the spirit of uh, conceptual spaces, then all rules of the following form, which we will call quasi change can be modeled. So we will have that uh, B1, of, uh, um, BI and BN implies X1, XJ, H1, H, HK. And in this case, we will call this quasi-chain if it's the case that uh, there is a first order atom which shares at most one variable with, so one first order atom bi which shares at most one variable with bi up to bi minus one. So these quasi-chain rules, they still are uh, reasonably important. For example, you can still express reachability using this language. Uh, and of course, this is a language that covers, covers much more, or quasi change rules cover much more than what uh, it's possible to, to model in, for example, using bilinear models. So in this sense, 
what we were trying to do here in, in this work is uh, finding a way of uh, modeling uh, modeling rules. So, so in find, finding a model which can capture important rules. And the other second important part of, of, of these uh, results is that we show that existing, existing models, they cannot capture uh, even reasonable, easy, simple uh, rules, for example, like uh, relation hierarchies. Uh, as I was saying then, in this case, uh, logic becomes important because it allows you to, to, to look at the expressiveness of the different uh, embedding models, uh, how they are compatible. So how the embedding vector space embeddings are compa compatible with the notion of capturing ontologies. Um, yeah, so I will try to be brief um, and finish this, this last part since we are short on time. Uh, we are back on using somehow looking more at, at, at the symbolic part, in which sense, in the sense that uh, we don't want to use uh, neural representations or we don't want to use logic to improve the, 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 the performance of, of neural, neural models, but it's the other way around, right? So we want to use the information that one, can, that one could get from neural representations to allow for more flexible reasoning. So the question is how to make uh, reasoning in uh, symbolic systems, not to rear or to brittle. And what is the motivation behind this? Uh, well, it's the need of interpretability uh, by means that uh, there is, this means that sometimes there is no alternative than using rule-based methods. As we were saying before, the, a little bit the problem of uh, rule-based methods is that they are not capable to learn something that is outside or patterns that are outside of the training data. So they can only cover situations that are in there. On the other hand, neural networks, they are able to, to interpolate uh, across these different situations. So they have this kind of inductive generalization capabilities that rule-based methods they, they don't have. So the question is, can we add these inductive generalization capabilities to rule-based methods uh, to uh, interpolate between previously seen situations. So how we use the information obtained from uh, neural networks to do so. So we are interested in uh, inductive reasoning. So imagine we have uh, the following situation. We have that tomatoes contain uh, vitamin B6, uh, mushrooms contain vitamin B6. Then we could induce that carrots contain uh, vitamin B6. This seems like a reasonable induction to do. Why? Because uh, in a sense, tomatoes and mushrooms, they are vegetables, which don't have too much in common. And uh, therefore, uh, therefore uh, it would be, it, it is reasonable to say that carrots also have uh, vitamin B6. Why? Because they, they, they don't share too many features besides, or too many properties besides the fact of being vegetables. The three of them are vegetables. So it's, it's, it's reasonable to, to conclude then that carrots also contain vitamin B6. Because the only knowledge that we have is that they are uh, vegetables. Uh, how about if we have the following? We have that kale contains vitamin B6, uh, that the spinach contains vitamin B6. Uh, could we, there, is there a good reason to induce that carrots contain also vitamin B6? Um, in this case, it's, kind of unclear, right? Because kale and spinach, they are in a sense, very similar uh, vegetables because they, they are both uh, green leaves and they have many, many properties in common. So there is no reason to, to believe that uh, then carrots will also contain vitamin B6 because this is something that could be specific to this kind of vegetables only. So yeah, we, there are no res good reasons to induce uh, further this to, to, to carrots. How about using taxonomies? Can we use uh, taxonomies to somehow decide whether should we do the, uh, the induction or not? Well, not really right. The problem is that taxonomies are just to, to course in the sense that they don't really talk about the features and the properties of the different concepts. So we only know that, for example, uh, an 
eatable mushroom is a vegetable, that the spinach is a vegetable, and that kale is a vegetable. We know that carrot is a root vegetable, which happens to be a vegetable, but it doesn't talk too much about which kind of properties they, they share, which kind of cognitive features they share, whether they are really uh, close in the sense that uh, they, they, they are defined by the same uh, main properties or they are simply two vegetables that are far apart because uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't share really too much things in common. So coming back then to, to, to the idea of using um, vector representations, uh, we cannot really do this as, as, as I was saying at the pure symbolic level, but we can again rely on the fact of embedding these concepts in some vector space. And the basic idea is that this, this uh, embedding, so these uh, geometric representations, what they normally tell us is uh, how far apart they are depending on the properties that they share. In this case, for example, we will have that uh, tomatoes and mushrooms, we know that both of them are vegetables. We know that both contain vitamin C, but they, they are in a sense far apart because they don't have too many properties besides being vegetables. What this means uh, in exchange is that all uh, concepts that I have in the middle between uh, tomatoes and, and mushroom must probably have the same properties, right? Because uh, the, the main, the, the basic feature properties that these, these have, then these elements that I have in the middle between mushrooms and tomatoes, they, they should also share. So intuitively what this is telling me is that uh, carrots are conceptually between mushrooms and tomatoes. And therefore they should share the most uh, natural basic features of both uh, tomatoes and mushrooms. So this, uh, Indeed, this, this notion of betweenness allows me then to decide whether I should be able to do induction or not, in the sense that uh, whether I can decide whether carrots contain vitamins, vitamin C or, or not. So the question is uh, then how do I obtain this notion of betweenness, right? So once again, I have this at the geometric level, but is there a way that I can now have this at the uh, symbolic level in such a way that I allow for flexibility in the reasoning at the symbolic level. Uh, and yes, the, the answer is yes. So there are there have been met the there have been methods that have been developed uh, in such a way that from textual representations you can uh, infer textual representations that are embedded, and then you can. Uh, extract from geometric betweenness, conceptual betweenness, right? For example, uh, you could uh, learn things like Abbey is between or conceptually between castle and chapel. Uh, you have that bistro is conceptually between restaurant and tea room. So uh, this is good news because then now you ha we have potentially uh, this symbolic information available to decide whether two things are conceptually between uh, or two concepts are, a concept is be conceptually between two other ones and then implement uh, flexible reasoning. Uh, using this kind of ideas, uh, recently, for example, a method was developed using graph convolutional networks in which uh, you can do interpolation in a sense, right? Uh, so how this works is that you have uh, for example, what we want is the following. You have a red table wine, implies table one, dry, one, dry white wine implies table one, bonburi implies table one. So, and then you want to induce that dry red wine then implies table one. The, the first three rules are given in the knowledge base and the other one is the one that you, the, that you are learning. Uh, how do, Intuitively how this is done is by introducing uh, second order predicates, which are template rules in which the yellow part, this is a placeholder. So you could imagine that you don't have red table one, but you just have this yellow, yellow, yellow implies a uh, table one. And then you want to, to, to learn from the structure of these templates, whether uh, there is some other predicate that implies table one. Intuitively, what this is telling me is that dry, 
dry red wine is uh, conceptually between or is sharing the same properties as red table wine, dry white, white wine, or bonberry uh, wine. Uh, the basic idea is then to, to have this graph neural network where you annotate each uh, node with, with a vector, which contains prior knowledge about the predicates, and then the edges contain uh, information about the templates, right? Which kind of predicates are, are participating in, in which uh, templates. Just in a similar idea, but now the templates are not unary as in the case that we have here. So here the placeholder was just this one. So the, 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 yeah, the placeholder we have, but now we have binary templates where we have two placeholders. We have this one uh, and this one. So in this case, we can not only learn uh, using interpo interpolation, but we can also uh, learn using analogies. Uh, indeed, the system, the, this uh, approach is uh, capable of doing the following. So given in your knowledge base, uh, mean, men's team X implies exists to a Y such that has member X, Y and man Y and mixed team X implies X, Y has member X, Y and woman Y. So it can do an analogy in the sense that it will infer or we learned a new rule saying that woman's team X implies X is Y has member X, Y and woman Y. So, and the analogy is because uh, it's, this rule is analogical to this one in the sense that uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the same uh, template, but uh, applied to, to, to women instead of, of men. One of the, of the things is that uh, this uh, previous work is uh, mainly heuristic as, as you have seen, then there you have, uh, you use graph neural networks to decide whether or to learn the, the, the new rules, these new interpolation rules. But uh, recently we have been kind of more interested in developing a model theoretic semantics for inter interpolative reasoning in description logics. So once again, we want to take advantage of the fact that we can learn this uh, between us between two different concepts, this conceptual between us between two different concepts, and then incorporate this knowledge within the ontology and then define a semantics allowing to do interpolation. So what, what do I mean by this? Imagine that you have uh, in your ontology that our, every rabbit is a herbivore, that every giraffe is a herbivore, and that the zebra is uh, between rabbit and a giraffe, right? So what this means is that the zebra has exactly the, the same basic properties or the same natural properties as rabbit and giraffe, and doing interpolation, what I would like to conclude then is that a zebra is also a herbivore. In this work, we have followed two different paths for defining the semantics. So one is uh, using features. So this basic idea that uh, concepts have associated some cognitive, uh, co cognitive features. And this follows a little bit the lines of formal concept analysis. And uh, the other kind of semantics that we have designed, once again, borrows from the notion of conceptual spaces. So in this case, we, we have uh, geometric models, just as the one that, that we were discussing before. So in terms of uh, spatial reasoning. It's, it's not trivial exactly to know what is the, 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 the right semantics to do this kind of interpolation. So the, the path that we have, we have followed from the start is to start with a, a basic uh, description logic language like EL, in which we know that the, the semantics that we have works well for interpolation, but it's uh, some, somehow challenging to decide whether these semantics can be lifted to more complex uh, languages or what are the requirements to do so uh, Yeah, in such a way that it makes sense. So it seems that the, uh, the NI had enough time to, to, to finish this, uh, this part, which uh, was the remaining one. And this uh, uh, concludes the, the the tutorial. And as you saw, there were we were touching many many points uh, regarding the relationship between logic and neural networks. And 
the main the main ingredient or the main thing that we wanted to tackle is how uh, neural representations have been used for uh, representing knowledge. But of course, uh, there are some cases or one of the main interests for this community would, is also how can we use the, the information that one has obtained from neural, net, neural networks to improve the reasoning or to define a more flexible reasoning within uh, existing uh, ontology or rule languages. Um, of course, there are many things open, even in, in the site of neural networks, uh, for example, like establishing or which might be challenging, establishing whether, uh, for example, language models are doing really reasoning or they are doing uh, just some guessing. Uh, uh, establishing, for example, the logical expressiveness of transformers. As far as I know, this has not been done. Some work has already been done in establishing the logical expressiveness of uh, graph neural networks or uh, empir empirically uh, design or decide which kind of reasoning uh, graph neural networks are able to do. But uh, yeah, there are many, many things open and mainly those related with, with common sense reasoning, which uh, seems to be much more challenging. <laughs>